Off to me. I'll keep it. Madam so, Mayor, it's six o'clock. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this Tuesday, October 30th, Special City Commission meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Mayor Pam Triolo. Here. Vice Mayor Andy Everosa. Here. <laughs> Commissioner Scott Maxwell. Here. Commissioner Omari Hardy. Here. Commissioner Herman Robinson. Here. Thank you. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Commissioner Maxwell. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, any, are there any additions, deletions, or reordering? No, ma'am. Seeing there are none, we shall move on. Um, presentations, commission liaison reports and comments. Commissioner Robinson, would you like to start? Yes. <laughs> uh, busy week, uh, always in exciting time to be in Lake Worth. Uh, Read to the uh, elementary schools, uh, really beautiful uh, day of seeing children uh, and their smiling faces. At, at South, I went to South grade, two classes there, Bridges and Highland, I did two classes there. And it was uh, really a joyful time for me. Um, uh, homecoming. Uh, went to homecoming, uh, saw the Trojan band and the, uh, the, the halftime uh, performance. It was a show. Um, the museum, uh, Lake Worth Museum opened today, uh, Saturday. Uh, it was a, a great opening. Um, talent show Saturday night was the mayor's, uh, uh, the mayor's not her show, but uh, she was she was a great part of it. Um, the towers had a uh, fifty year uh, celebration and uh, last mortgage payment. Um, leisure services outdid themselves again uh, with the uh, the Halloween uh, festivities. Uh, again, to see all the young people in Lake Worth downtown with their parents having a good time uh, celebrating uh, being together in Lake Worth was was fantastic. Um, I'm glad to see electric cars on the uh, agenda. Um, and I well, I mentioned leisure services, but I, I every day they they keep astounding their success. Uh, the, uh, the block party uh, was fabulous and we're going to have another one. It's probably be better this Friday. Um, but all those good things. Um, the nation suffered again um, a tragedy in Pittsburgh and uh, we need to be uh, mindful of how we speak, words matter, um, and uh, I uh, am afraid that we'll have more of the same. If we can, we can't legislate uh, what people say, but we can work towards legislation to have a much better, reasonable gun legislation and you know when when we say what can we do everybody in america has to understand that you don't need an ar-15 uh, in your home uh, and if we could make our legislators understand that uh, you need to ask them to to be reasonable with uh, responsible gun ownership. So that's what I'm asking America to do is, is don't just say you're going to do your prayers and, and uh, 
That's it. We need action on gun control. Uh, and I, I, uh, I'm sorry I have to say that, but uh, if we, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Let's try to stick with our reporting from the community if we can. That is part of our community. Understood. And, that's, and right. that, that's why I, I. That's why you're continuing to go on, and I didn't stop you. Thank you, Commissioner Amoroso. Um, yes, thank you to staff. Great, great uh, trick-or-treating on the avenue and Little Scream. Um, I was happy to host the costume contest I guess, this year with uh, John Fowles and Kathy Turk. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It was a great night. Um, Farmer's Market, Lake Worth Farmer's Market opened last Saturday. It'll carry on every Saturday up until March from 9 to 1 at Old Bridge Park. Also, the Twilight Market will start up again in December, December 13th. Uh, which will be also at Old Bridge Park. Um, a big happy birthday to Mark Easton from the Lake Worth Herald. Happy birthday, Mark. Um, I attended the Palm Beach County League of Cities, which I sit on the board. Also the Sober Home Task Force, the Economic Forum. Um, I'll be speaking at the Mango Grove uh, Neighborhood Association November 5th. I'll also be speaking at the South Palm, Beach, South Palm Park uh, November 12th. Up and coming events, a uh, lot going on. Season's coming, um, Herman was right. We have uh, our second block party, our Lake Avenue block party coming up on the 7th. Uh, we're coming up Friday and then um, Veterans Day is November 10th, a big parade. If you remember years ago, this uh, commission had brought back the Veterans Day parade and events. Um, uh, tree lighting is December 1st. Um, also followed by a block party. Holiday stroll is Friday, December 14th. Um, the big holiday par uh, parade is December 15th and bonfires on the beach start November 9th. That's all I've got. Commissioner Hardy? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I did um, was I went to the 10th annual Southeast Florida Regional Climate Summit. And um, basically this was started about 10 years ago um, and it was spearheaded by a woman named Kristen Jacobs, who uh, is a state representative in Broward County now. Um, she may have knocked on your doors about 10 years ago um, because she was running for Congress at that time. Um, but um, the three counties, Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami-Dade County, they signed a compact basically to take sea level rise seriously, which is the, the primary symptom of climate change. Um, and just you know, a little uh, statistic that the um, Water Management District put together by 2040, the seas in South Florida will be two feet higher than where they are, okay, by 2040. So if you go out to Bryant Park, I want you to stand on the seawall, look down, and imagine if the water is two feet higher than it is. And I want you to imagine what it might be during a high tide, right? And I want you to imagine what it might be during a storm surge. And that's basically what we're going to be dealing with. And um, basically, there's a lot of talk about resilience, right? So in Monroe County, they're spending billions of dollars raising their roads raising their municipal facilities. Um, when they build new municipal facilities, even new parks, they basically build it on a, on a berm of dirt that's two feet higher than it, than it otherwise would be. In Miami-Dade County, especially in the coastal communities, they're doing a lot. They, they're really having to spend a lot of money. Miami-Dade just approved a $400 million bond offering called Miami Together, excuse me, um, Miami, Forgever, uh, Miami Forever. Miami Beach is about to spend half a billion dollars um, basically making their community more resilient. And um, this is really important. And you know, we're a little lucky, first of all, because we're a little more north, our ground's a little higher, but we have a golf course in between the water and our residential communities. But even for those of us that have that kind of a buffer, um, as flood insurance rates increase and <laughs> Congress isn't doing the best job uh, with that, but flood insurance rates are, are, are not gonna be pretty over the next several years. And if local governments don't do things to mitigate against climate change, if the homeowner can't show that their local government has mitigated, their flood insurance rates, they're just gonna get whacked, right? And so over time, we have a responsibility over the next 20 or so years, we have a responsibility to do something to make our communities a little more resilient. I was a little disappointed because they're was basically no discussion or very little discussion. I, I shouldn't say no, there was very little discussion about what local communities can do to sort of stem the tide when it comes to climate change. And it's basically, look, we gotta get people um, for at least a few trips a day out of their cars. 
right? And it's funny because we're all at, a, all at a climate change conference and the majority of the people who were there who are from South Florida drove by themselves <laughs> to the conference, right? They, they, they did a, an unscientific poll by a raise of hands. The majority of people solo drove to um, Miami Beach for that conference. Um, very few people took the bright line um, and even the people who were living in Miami-Dade, very few of them took transit. That's something that we have to take seriously. And we have to find ways to incentivize people to take transit and to walk and to ride their bicycles. Um, so yeah, um, they talked a lot about the coastal link up there, Madam Mayor. Um, the other thing, and this was, that, that will change things tremendously. Um, the other thing that was a little bit disappointing and Mayor Shelley uh, Petrolia of um, Delray Beach and I were discussing it. There were only three elected officials from Palm Beach County there. Okay, it was myself, it was Mayor Shelley Petrolia, and it was Commissioner Paulette Burdick, um, County Commissioner Paulette Burdick, who's, who's on our way out. So we promised, uh, because we're gonna be experiencing the same things that they're experiencing in Miami-Dade County and in Monroe County in a few short years. We promised uh, to make some phone calls and try and get more of us down there so that we can see firsthand what our neighbors are dealing with and what we're gonna have to do in the future. Um, the block party is a really cool thing. It's coming up, I believe, um, about a week and a half from now. Um, is it, no, it's this Friday, right? It's this Friday, it's the first Friday of the month, correct? Okay, so that's literally this Friday. I was a little disappointed and um, Assistant City Manager Juan Ruiz knows this, that J Street was cut off from um, the block party. Um, I understand that there are some things that we have to talk about and discuss and figure out how we can get J Street involved, but that is, um, to me, it's it's the, kind of the heart of the, of the downtown as far as the music scene and, and, and you know, a lot of the, the food and, and music. And um, I would like to see them included in that in the future. And um, the only thing I'll say about national tragedies that have recently occurred um, is this. I was talking with a friend of mine in college. Um, he's a Muslim American. And um, we were having conversations about how we, how we talk about other people. And basically, um, what we agreed is that um, it's not just violent rhetoric that's hurtful, right? It's, it's any rhetoric that falsely and damagingly implicates a group of people in some sort of conspiratorial wrongdoing, right? And if we allow people around us to talk about groups of people, whether we're talking about Jewish Americans, whether we're talking about Muslim Americans, whether folks in other parts of the world are talking about folks in the West, if we allow any people to talk about a group of people as if they're conspiring against us somehow, and we don't push back against that and take some responsibility for our own issues, we're gonna see more tragedies like what we saw this week. So that's that's all I have to say about that. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, I don't have a whole lot um, uh, other than I have a very heavy heart for the tragedy in Pittsburgh. That, that incident took place not too terribly far from my apartment when I left to come here to South Florida. So um, I'm very familiar with that community and that neighborhood. Um, I'm very sorry. This, <clears throat> the insanity in our world has got to stop, ladies and gentlemen. And it, yes, the words are part of it. The rhetoric is part of it. But there are, 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 are I think bigger and, and, and larger root causes of what's going on. I think a lot of it is mental illness. Okay, a lot of it is our education system, and, and a lot of it has to do with um, you know things that maybe we can't directly control. We're influenced every day. We we, we each of us is and bombarded every day by thousands of messages from competing interests, whether it's financial interest, whether it's political interest, um, social interest, whatever. Uh, as human beings with with the, with the mass media and the social media it's not like it was 50 years ago where your access to the outside world was limited to three stations on your television and Walter Cronkite was telling you that's the way it is he spoke directly to what happened who the players were without his opinion and that was it we had a newspaper if you had a newspaper delivered to your home and in those days we believed what the journalists were writing because they had all sworn an oath or a commitment, if you will, to telling the truth and not opining, if you will. How we have degraded as a society to where everything that happens, everything out of a lot of our mouths has to have an opinion attached to it. 
as if somehow our opinion is more relevant or more important or more significant than the next. That has got to stop. We live in a world of individuals that have to work together as a, a human community, not a world of individuals who think that the world circulates around them as an individual. People that do these heinous things, you know, it, you know, in more cases than not, it's mental illness. I don't think it's enough to blame one simple, simple thing like rhetoric or anything like. I just, we've got to, we, we got to stop everybody, and we got to start thinking about what we're doing here on this planet. We really do. We've allowed the mainstream media, Madison Avenue, and special interests to guide our daily existence. We're more worried about what zip code we live in, how big of a car we can drive, than we are what's happening in our neighborhoods. We're selfish as a society, generally speaking. And that's not everybody, but there's too much of it. There's not enough community anymore. Everybody, it's every man for themselves. And it's fueled by the things I mentioned before, all these competing interests. And it all, it all comes back to, to money or power or position, whatever it is. And we just have got to stop. Everybody's got to stop and just close their eyes I really believe that most of us, if not all of us, are raised with pretty decent values to treat each other with respect, to follow the golden rule, all those basic things that we're taught as children, and we've let it get away. I'm not going to go on because I'm frankly not prepared to have that deep of a conversation, but it's got to stop and it begins with each one of us in this room okay yeah, everybody in Pittsburgh everybody in Colorado everybody in Parkland everybody everywhere it starts with us as individuals and let's stop blaming and, and, and pointing to symptoms of the root cause of our problems and start dealing with the root cause of our problems and I think oftentimes it really kind of lays at our feet you want to talk about legislation and our politicians well you know what we're the ones who put those folks in office okay we're responsible for if we like what's going on in Washington or we like what's going on in Tallahassee, we did that. So if we don't like it, we don't think that they're governing the well or whatever, we need to get, you know, we need to make some changes. So let's all take some, some responsibility for our own individual lives and, and, and need to look out for each other a little bit more and be a little bit more sensitive to our needs and, and care for one another. Enough of the lecture, but on a fun side of this, I'm going to tell you that I did read for the record. <laughs> I really enjoyed doing that, and I, I think I wrote, read to like 17,409 kids. And, and we won. Two goldfish, <laughs> you know, a gerbil, and other something. I don't know what it was. It was in a, it was all curled up. It looked like a snake. I don't know what it was, but it was a <laughs> lot. It was, I hate snakes. But no, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, the book this year was kind of cool, and um, I didn't screw up like I did a couple of years ago, showing up with a dog outfit. And the book wasn't about the dog. I just... I made a mistake. So, but anyway, I really enjoyed it. And how did we do, Madam Mayor? Do you happen to know if we... Uh... No, they haven't gotten the numbers in yet, okay. unfortunately. All so. right. Well, that's really all I have right now. And it just God bless all of us and God bless our country. And let's just, you know, work together a little better. Thanks. Hey, future of... Uh, when we look at what's going on, you know what I'm, you guys have said quite enough. I just want to say that we have an opportunity as the city of Lake Worth that is probably one of the best representations of a true American city today in today's world and the diversity that we have and who we are and what we do we probably have the best opportunity I always say that our city is could make make the best examples in this world in this small little microcosm of seven square miles we probably have the ability to to show the world what America really is about and I will tell you that the kids that come up after us, old folks, <laughs> they don't want problems and they don't want rhetoric and they don't want whatever. They want solutions. They want solutions. So it's our job as a, as a community to come together and create those solutions and make good stuff happening. Because I'll tell you right now, there's no better place that I've ever known than the city of Lake Worth. All right. Read for the record. Yes. It was a great book. Um, I read to two schools, and we had 7,400. No. <laughs> it was the little ones. Um, little Scream was awesome. I hope you got to see the lovely uh, Walking Dead uh, zombie-fied 
pictures of your fellow commissioners so that you can hold them up and throw darts at them the rest of the year round when you don't like something. <laughs> we had some great zombie faces. Um, speaking of zombies, Young Frankenstein at the Playhouse. Got a chance to see that with family and, and friends. Boy, what a terrific show that was. Shout out to them. And speaking of the Playhouse, had an opportunity to be there on Sunday night as I co MC the Lake Worth Scott Talent Competition with uh, Bob Dorenzo uh, of Remax Realty here in the community. And we raised, it looks so far like we hit the goal of raising $10,000 for Children's Miracle Network. So that was very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, the, let's see, what am I, the museum was incredible. If you guys have never been to the Lake Worth Museum, you have to check it out. The reorganization and the, and, and the new stuff that they got in there, it's uh, above where you pay, you know, the utility bills in the annex building. Absolutely incredible. Thank you to everyone and especially all the volunteers that put in so many hours getting that place up to par and beyond. There's new exhibits and it's just phenomenal. Um, the tower is celebrating their 50th. Yes, burn that mortgage down. Who would have ever thought? How would it happen today that HUD would give you $2.4 million to buy a city block and build a building like that? They're not doing it today. Right, yeah. <laughs> but they get to burn that mortgage in there, and they have celebrated, and they were just absolutely wonderful. Thank you to everyone who welcomed us. Um, MPO at this last meeting was kind of uh, was a lot of um, paperwork stuff they're relocating the mpo um has established itself as the tpa now so i won't be using mpo i'll be saying tpa and the transportation planning association agency, agency thank you <laughs> transportation planning agency is uh relocating and becoming uh its own individual group uh before it was kind of a co-supported funded sponsored with the county and now it will stand alone, an individual, and be an independent distributor of all the transportation funds. So there's a lot of controversy over the years on whether it should be, what it shouldn't be, or whatever other counties have done that already. Broward County, Dade County, they've already established that. So there were a lot of uh, paperwork to do with their moving, their buildings, their establishments, and whatnot. So it was a lot happening. There is no traditional November meeting, so we'll be back in the saddle uh, for December. And then we usually have a, a, a an event where we encourage everybody to try out every form of transportation known to mankind that we have available other than a car in January. So I'll let you know what that is and maybe you can join me. Okay. Thursday education. Pardon me? Thursday education. Oh, Thursday is our, yes. Thursday we have a workshop with members of the Palm Beach County School Board, our members and our representatives here. And we'll be discussing some of the things that are happening locally, what's going on in our schools, um, what's being, it'll it's be here at City Hall at the 4.30. At 4 though. And, but it's in the next room over. Oh, it's gonna be in the conference room? It is. Room? Okay. Mayor's always the last to know. Um, in, the, in the conference room next door. So if you're more than welcome to come again, it's going to be at 4.30. 4.30 on Thursday. All right, and we'll have members of the Palm Beach County School Board there. And again, we'll be talking about what's going on in our neighborhoods, our schools, needs, necessities, ideas, and politically and everything else, and then some. So I hope you'll join us. All right, public participation of non-agended items and consent agenda items. We've got, let's see, public comment, public comment. Public comment on top. Is this public comment? Anna, is this public comment? Yeah, okay. But the, the, um, there was a little girl who had put her card in first. Oh, yeah? Oh, she can go first. That's okay. Oh. You want to go first? Krista? All right. Sorry. They just piled them up on my thing and I just okay. picked the top. <laughs> My name's Krista. I'm a sophomore at Dreyfus School of the Arts, and I've recently started a project at, to introduce three water bottle refill stations and reusable water bottles to all the students and staff at Highland Elementary, which is the Title I Ethnic Diverse School here in Lake Worth. Since kids in elementary school are at such an impressionable age, I find it's very important to teach them young to initially refuse plastic so it translates into the future for the better of our, the health of society and the environment. A uh, recent survey went out at Highland Elementary and we found that 80,000 water bottles, plastic water bottles were consumed annually, and that's only at Highland. 
There's actually a statistic that says 9% of plastic is only recycled, only 9%. And of the plastic that's consumed, one ounce of plastic emits one ounce of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But Stanford University actually has other resources that says five ounces of carbon dioxide are emitted for every ounce of plastic that's made. That's why it's very important to eliminate plastic altogether and teaching them young is a great way to do that. The way I want to do it is implement uh, water refill stations. They fill the water bottle up and they count how many water bottles they fill up. So it shows the efficiency of it. And they're also very easy to maintain, which makes it very appropriate for the school and the project of itself. I'm only $350 away from my second refill station. I'm currently working to get the water bottles to, for each of the students and staff at Highland Elementary, which would be $4,500 to get all of the water bottles. Not only would the stations be sustainable for the school itself, but the water bottles would be sustainable for the individuals as they go through their life. I'm here to ask if there's like any type of funding I can have. Are there any water bottles that are from past events? If there's any resources or information the city has that can help me with this initiative. I've recently had little mini pop-up books donated and other pop-up books from Roger Culbertson that are towards education and a variety of other subjects. If you know anybody who would like to buy them and have them or have buy them and give them to different schools to increase literacy, I'd, have, I'd love any information that you have for me. You have me, sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Schedule an appointment with me. Yeah, get, get can, can I ask if, if we can refill these bottles? Yes. The water refill stations would be refillable to any kind. Any kind of bottles. Okay. Right. Thank you, Krista. I really appreciate it. Anna, Krista, you're up next. Yes, you just missed. I, I, you know, it's amazing. I just hoarded 30 gallons of plastic. 30 gallons of plastic water bottles, but they made me throw them in the dumpster. And right, be I ordered, it's amazing, it's a whole recycle story. I just ordered recycling bins, they didn't come in time. They actually got thrown out in the dumpster, and I was hoarding all of them for what you're doing. So the next, you know, I, I still hoard them up, and I have a recycling bin now. All right, Anna. But there were 30. Oh, we got it. Sure. Sorry, you got, you're on the clock. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes, she is. Um, I'm interested in learning more, just in context, you know, with. You know, I'm not really into what happened at the border, but, you know, mum's the word because anything that you say seems to, um, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost not even, it's not really mental illness, it's it's kind of like mean on a on an evil political level, a lot like, you know, my water bottles or whatever. But anyway, um, I'm interested more in, in mural stuff and, um, Yes, it, you know, also like another thing that is not mental illness is that I, I don't believe in the creation of arms. I don't believe in the creation of arms at all. Like I don't, um, like I do, you know, just like I do believe in recycling and had 30 water, 30 huge gallons of water to recycle in plastic. Um, I, I don't believe in the creation of arms and I, I can't say that I'm into what happened at the border nor what happened at um, at the temple and, and all of that, so. Thank you. Anna. You know, more people could, you know, with other sides of the theory of mental illness, the other sides, hence, you know, they could take advantage of cognitive, cognitive behavioral theory. Um, most people say, you know, so many cognitive, cognitive intuitions, cognitive types do suffer, cognitive <coughs> people, Many cognitive people suffer um, between triad traits, triad traits that are pretty much, you know, that, that a cognitive plane in someone's triad behavior um, just gets right ahead and the little people suffer or, or all of that, which, you know, many mentally ill people have no interest in, in triad, so they would rather discuss that, you know, with the people who do have triad tendencies. So that's the end of my time. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Ronald Hensley. Good evening, Mayor. My name is Ronald Hensley, Assistant Ambassador to Lake Worth. Um, the reason I'm here is I've got questions about the uh, Greenway that has gone, in, especially the one on 8th Avenue North, which was 8th Avenue North. All the greenways look really good and everything all the way down to 5th Avenue South, minus the accident that was there, I guess, this last week and everything, which took out quite a bit of it. But on 8th Avenue North especially, I see a lot of through traffic still. People are still driving through it like it's 
still a city street. Uh, residents are very confused about whether it is a street and their parking and stuff like that. Uh, we need balusters through there. They've got some kind of orange barricades now uh, from C Street all the way down to uh, just past E Street. Well, those ain't doing no good because kids are playing on them, using them as bike ramps, using them as lay beds and stuff like that. And an accident's gonna happen. I've already seen specifically right there at the 8th North and A Street, vehicle, vehicles are pulling in. They can't turn around to, back, to get out like they should. So they drive over the city grass and stuff to turn around to get out. And the other day, one had backed up and hooked his uh, tow ball on one of the cables to the telephone pole and almost ripped it completely out because trap people are parking on the cement, which is intended for just to turn in only to the property and stuff. And people can't turn around what, like they're supposed to be doing, you know. And it's just a matter of time, somebody's going to get hurt, especially if the car comes flying down through there, the way kids are in the screenway now and everything. And the ambassador, myself, and another friend was out there one day, and this guy was not going to stop for nobody. We stood there, he looked at us stupid, and just kept on going through. And if he wouldn't have moved, he'd have been run over. And this is not the first, that's not the first, it's happened at least five times I can count. That there needs to be balusters put in there to stop this traffic coming through there because it's only a matter of time, like I said, somebody's going to get hurt. And that's pretty much all I got to say about that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Tom Connor, aforementioned ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Tom Connor, 728 North A Street. Uh, what we're having problems with in the Greenway also, um, on the major thoroughfares, we're finding a lot of the children now are using it for the school purposes to go back and forth. So now we're getting uh, more children. On the major thoroughfare, like um, D Street has a light. So a lot of people are going down D Street and what, what they're doing is they're flying down D Street because there's a yield sign on the Greenway. So there's not like a stop sign that they would stop if a little kid is or adult would be in the Greenway walking across the little crosswalk there. And I know there's a few people almost got hit there. And I think what we need to do is not the whole Greenway needs to be stop sign like B or whatever, but the main thoroughfares like you have D Street's a good example. Those busiest streets need to be observed because someone is gonna get hit and it's gonna be a child. They're starting to use it now like 6.30 in the morning to walk to school. I'd rather see them use the Greenway to walk to school than walk our streets because actually it is more safer. And that's all I gotta say and thank you commissions and everybody for doing a great job. Thank you. Nancy Starr. Is that, is that for this item or for another item? Another item. It is, okay. What item? What item? Number 16. Oh, okay, gotcha. It's a 9A. 9A. Okay. Carla Robinson, is that for this item? Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I just want to say on the... Um, M Street. I'm sorry, could you just state your name and address for the record? Oh, Carla Robinson, 120 North M Street. Thank you. So, at Lucerne and M Street, there's a PNC bank there mm -hmm. and what was South Shore. It's torn up bad. Like, I have pictures if you can see them. But when I asked about it, they said second week in November. But then I saw the um, contractor. He's like, no, not till Christmas. Madam Mayor, excuse me, may I take the privilege? Um, I called on that too. And as far as I know, um, it'll be paved on Monday. Juan, would you please see to it? Yeah, because we don't want to break protocol here with individual yeah, members addressing sorry. members, please. If you wouldn't mind, get with the assistant city manager right after we're, right after you're done. Okay. He'll be able to give you the information. Well. Thank you. I just need it fixed because it's ruining our wheelchair van. Okay. Mm -hmm understand thank you did you have anything else that you want you still have some time no, I'm good. okay thank you very much 
Okay, thank you everyone very much. I appreciate it. Juan, do you have any more comment cards? That's it, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So, I'm sorry, no, excuse me, no, I forgot yeah. the minutes. Approval of the minutes. No, there's no minutes. So it's consent agenda. Um, I apologize. Gonna, why, why were you stopping me then? <laughs> because I've been waiting for um, quasi-judicial. I apologize. I didn't want you to take a motion You're on that. you making me all nervous. I now. shouldn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she gave me the stink eye. Okay. <laughs> so sorry. I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda, please. So moved. Moved by, let's see, the vice mayor, seconded by Commissioner Hardy. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we're moving on to the public hearing. <sighs> <laughs> we're good. At this time, the title of the ordinance should be read into the record, if you wouldn't mind, City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ordinance number 2018-17, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lake Ward, Florida, approving the creation of a mixed-use urban plan development district located at 1601 North Dixie Highway, consisting of approximately 5.48 acres, as more particularly described in Exhibit A, that is located within the mixed-use Dixie Highway zoning district with a future land use designation of mixed-use east that includes the specific development standards as further described in Exhibit B. Approving the application to participate in the Sustainable Bonus Incentive Program, approving a major site plan for the construction of a mixed-use development consisting of 230 residential units and 9,700 square feet of commercial space, providing a severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Just a reminder to everyone that I have to follow this. It's quasi-judicial, so I have to follow according to this script. So please do not ask me to speak outside of this area or ask any questions as I have to follow it in this format for legal reasons. Thank you. Do the commissioners have any ex parte communications to disclose at this time? Commissioner Robinson? Yes. I've got a call from uh, Attorney Michael Weiner uh, just notifying me that uh, uh, of what was coming up on the agenda. I have had meetings with both the develops, developers and Michael Weiner on this uh, project. I've had meetings with the developer about this project. Great. Nice to meet you. No, I'm afraid I've been left out of the loop. I've had no conversations. Okay, I received a phone call in reference to this item coming up on the agenda about, about the item. Okay, Mayor seats. All those giving testimony, please stand, raise your right hand, face the city attorney and be sworn in. Is there anybody? Okay, there you go. City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're out to provide at this hearing now in session is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. When you come up to speak, please state your name and address and who you represent. Okay. And then staff at this time, um, William or any other city employee, do you have a presentation to give? Mark, you're going to give one. Okay. Then, okay. Okay. Um, So the applicant doesn't have a presence, so we're going to do our presentation first. Okay. You ready? Does the applicant be part of this presentation, and should they be? The applicant will have their own presentation following staff's presentation. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, for the record, Mark Stiver is deputy director for Department of Community Sustainability. Um, what we have before us tonight is a a project that is. Um, anticipated in our land development regulations, though it's not one we've seen here in the city, uh, at least in a long time. This is a project that creates a urban plan development. And in doing so, there's a unique process these go under that are slightly different than a normal site plan. Um, so what you have tonight is an ordinance that is proposing the creation of a district that would allow for this development and through the process of this creation of this ordinance a site plan is tied to this new district if you will so tonight uh, where normally a site plan is approved by the planning and zoning board or the historic resource preservation board um, tonight you're being asked to approve everything the site plan the sustainable bonus and the ordinance that creates the district okay so, and again, this is slightly different than what we're used to, but this is how these things work. The, the creation of the zone, the standards that are created around it, the sustainable bonus, the site plan all have to work together and it's approved as one package, okay? 
So what we have before us tonight is the applicant is 1601 Dixie, and it's represented by um, Jeff Burns, who's here tonight, and Michael Weiner, uh, their attorney. The address is 1601 North Dixie Highway. This is located in the mixed-use Dixie Highway District and has a future land use category of mixed-use East. Um, so the request before the commission, as I mentioned, is to amend the official zoning map, which is how we look at this, to create a mixed-use urban plan development district and approve the master development plan for this project to approve the sustainable bonus incentive program for this project, which is part of the, the master development plan, to approve the site plan, which is all part of the master development plan. And all tied together with this are specific design standards that some of them will vary slightly from the current design standards in the, in the LDRs. So first of all, let's talk about where we are. Um, the site is located on Dixie Highway. If I can get this, there it is. So this is Dixie Highway going north. This is on the west side of Dixie Highway. And the site is a little over 5.4 acres. This is how it looks currently along the, the frontage of the site along Dixie Highway. And this is the a rendering of the proposed development that's going in. So this will be the view from Dixie Highway. Um, as I mentioned before, tied to this approval is the site plan. This is a copy of the site plan with the first floor elevations being shown. Um, they'll go into it in more detail, but this is 17th here. There's an access point here, an access point on 16th. Um, traffic will come in this way. This is parking for the commercial area and or guests and then there is a, a gate here and a gate here <coughs> and these gates will control access back into the the parking that is dedicated for the residents of this development um, the other one I, I did bring and in, in your packet you should have had a full set of the plans I wanted to highlight also the landscaping plan this is a topic we've been discussing quite significantly here in the future or in the future also in the future but that we've been discussing here and uh, what we have worked with the developer to do is to improve the landscaping um, along Dixie Highway. Um, one of the issues that has, has been discussed here is the importance of providing a, an improved pedestrian experience. So we've worked with the developer to provide not only palm trees as an accent, but providing a significant number of shade trees along there so that when, when in fully developed and in growth, um, the frontage will have a, a nice presentation along the sidewalk. Secondly, is you'll have, if you remember from the um, elevation picture, there's the commercial <coughs> part of this, which is about 9,700 square feet of commercial space, faces onto Dixie Highway. So you'll have a, a more activated front along Dixie Highway with the residential areas in the back. Um, staff did go through and evaluated thoroughly the entire project, looking at it, um, the surrounding properties, looking at the impact to the area, looking at the, the neighborhood. Um, as required by the code, we have to compare this to our comprehensive plan, we have to compare it to our land development regulations, and without going into all details, unless you have any specific questions, um, we found this, this project generally in compliant with those um, ordinances and policies. Uh, there are a set of recommended conditions to attach to this um, that staff is recommending be adopted as, as part of the um, ordinance and site plan for this project. Um, second to this, as I mentioned, is a, a table that shows the development standards, and you guys should all have a copy of that in your, in your backup material. Um, with the creation of this district, the applicant has the ability to propose standards other than what we have in the current ordinance and those those proposed standards are then evaluated by staff to make sure that it still meets the intent of the district um, we have been working with the applicant for a long time and and staff feels comfortable that the development standards that are being proposed which includes added height um, a change in the impermeable surface area an increase in density that's also tied to the sustainable bonus program and a change in the, in the total parking requirements have all been acceptable in terms of meeting the general criteria or the general standard of this district. Um, then Exhibit C, as I mentioned before, um, you should all have a list of the recommended conditions the staff has put together um, for the different departments to um, condition the approval uh, um, so that we can move forward with this should you move to approve it. Um, that is staff's 
Um, this project did go before the Planning and Zoning Board. The Planning and Zoning Board reviewed this and recommended unanimously to move this forward to you for approval. Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, the applicant, with, I'm sorry. Yeah, with that, the um, staff's done with the presentation and, and the, uh, turn it back over to you, Mayor, for the applicant's presentation, Joe. Okay. The applicant may now make a presentation and ask staff questions. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Weiner with the business address of uh, 6111 Broken Sound Parkway in Boca Raton, Florida. Pleasure to be here tonight. Um, long process for this. Uh, 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 it's a great program that you pulled together because you pulled together all of the various facets of a development for your consideration. You've heard that your lower boards have all met this project with approval, um, and we look forward to a, an approval tonight. Um, the developer is a 1601 Dixie LLC, and that's a part of affiliated development. That's the actual applicant. Um, as you saw from the city's presentation, we're at uh, 16th North and 17th North on Dixie. Um, that's where we get that name mid. We're halfway between uh, downtown Lake and Lucerne and our northern border. Uh, presenting tonight on behalf of the project will be Mr. Jeff Burns, who's the co-founder and CEO of Affiliated Development. They specialize in residential de development. Jeff, after graduating from the University of Missouri School of Business, became involved in the real estate business. He has more than 13 years of experience in acquisition, development, and finance. Uh, he has a proven track record, uh, developed over 2 million square feet with a combined total cost of roughly $500 million. That included about 1,200 residential apartment units. Um, all of these projects have had their uh, financing uh, innovations, such as uh, private-public partnerships. That's what he specializes in. Notable was in 2006, Jeff partnered with the developers in uh, Milwaukee uh, for the Modern, a 30-story high-rise residential tower in Milwaukee's downtown. It was mixed use. He and his partners managed to close on financing of $65 million during the height of the real estate difficulties. They completed the project in 2012. It was six years, but it's completed, fully leased operational, and has won a number of awards in the local area for improving the economy. Uh, Jeff presently is a resident of uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale, a member of the Fort Lauderdale Downtown Council Board of Governors, and he's particularly proud of this project. So if you would, Jeff, please come forward and uh, speak to the commission. Thank you. My name is Jeff Burns, the CEO of uh, Affiliated Development. And uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Board of Commission, thank you uh, for having us here today. We're excited to uh, kind of walk you through the development and tell you a little bit about uh, about the project. Um, I will point out we have been working with uh, with city staff for for nearly a year on this, and they've been extremely uh, uh, helpful in helping us uh, get the project uh, that we're about to present to you. So. Um, so we can go. Do you have the clicker up there on the It's it's here. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Um. So all right. So we got the site plan. So um, thought we'd start with the site plan. Uh, just talk a little bit about the project as a whole and how we laid it out. Uh, as you can see, the buildings. Um, are uh, lining 16th and 17th. One of the reasons we did that was because we didn't want there to be a view of parking. Uh, we wanted there to be a walkability on either uh, a street to create a residential feel. Um, there's going to be ground level units on 16th and 17th. Along uh, Dixie Highway, we, we felt that it was very important to incorporate a commercial component. Uh, we're doing a, a, a live work uh, component there where you will have uh, your live uh, residences on the west side and then your work uh, on the uh, east side. Um, and all of our developments, uh, it's extremely important for us to incorporate a strong commercial component, uh, especially when we're going to have, you know, 230 units, uh, a lot of people live in there. We need them to be able to uh, have a place that they can walk to. Uh, you know, we see the, the commercial space in all of our developments as an amenity to the tenants. So we wanted to make sure that it was A, affordable. Uh, we want to give people the opportunity to start up a business. We want to make sure that these businesses don't compete with one another. So we make sure if we, we have a gym that we're not doing another gym right next door to them. Um, and uh, 
some of the feedback we've gotten, we, we've done a lot of research on this uh, live work space, and some of the feedback we've gotten is really interesting because uh, we initially thought this would be uh, business owners that would then uh, want to you know, live right next to where they work. But what we found out is that a lot of folks that are interested in, in this type of space might uh, uh, offer this as a concession to uh, their, their manager of uh, whether it's a restaurant or something like that. They can have that person on site and offer that as part of their compensation package, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, again, it's important for us to have a, a mix of daytime and nighttime uses uh, for that space. So we're going to be very picky about who we uh, have for that space because it's going to control our front door uh, to the uh, development. As you enter, you can enter in through 16th or 17th. We wanted to provide two access points so there wasn't a, a tremendous amount of traffic uh, heading in either one. Uh, as you enter, uh, we have the uh, parking for the uh, LiveWork commercial space, uh, also uh, uh, res or, uh, uh, visitors of the, of the tenants. So uh, what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to put our clubhouse out front so that um, folks that are coming to visit uh, our residents, uh, number one, they have to go in and check in. They have to be called up and buzzed through. So uh, security is a very important thing for us here and, and to give uh, 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 people a sense that there's going to be a warm body greeting them as they walk in and 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 come to visit uh, uh, one of the residents. Um, I'll go through the uh, clubhouse in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, again, we wanted to bury, not bury the parking, but, but essentially put it on the inside of the development so that it wasn't visible from, from the outside streets as you're driving by. Uh, the other challenge that we had with that is that you have about half the units that are then facing a lot of um, uh, uh, pavement. So what we wanted to make sure that we did was incorporate a, uh, all of our amenities and green space in the middle of our development so that as people sit on their balconies and, and, and look out, they have a visually uh, pleasing uh, view. Uh, they see the activity. We wanted to make sure um, uh, that we uh, uh, put our amenities within the middle part of the development so that it caused for people to be more interactive with one another. Dog parks, uh, uh, as we have further to the, to the west there, 65% of residents have dogs. Um, that becomes a social aspect for people. The first thing they do in the morning when you have a pet, you put a leash on it, grab your coffee, and you go take them on a walk and let them do his business. So uh, we wanted to create that to be a very uh, social, interactive experience. We also have a game lawn. Uh, it's meant for uh, dual purpose. So we left the middle of it open uh, and, and uh, line the, uh, the outside of it or the perimeter with trees to provide a very uh, a different type of feel. So if you're in the middle, you're throwing a baseball or a frisbee or something like that around the uh, perimeter. We're going to have hammocks uh, that line the trees so that uh, people can go out there with a book and, and relax. Um, the uh, resort style pool, um, another uh, big amenity uh, that, that we feel is important. People expect these days in this, in this type of a, of a development. Uh, and then again, I'm gonna go through the uh, clubhouse in a little bit more detail later on. One other thing I'd like to point out is that we do have the trash uh, rooms uh, along the perimeter. So one thing we wanted to prevent was the trucks from having to enter and come through a bunch of parking and weave in and out of pedestrians and all that. So. What we're doing is we're, we're having them on either side so that it's a very easy way for them to come in, unload, you know, and, and be on their way. Um, and, and those are along the perimeter. Um, as we, okay. This just shows you a little bit more of a, a detailed landscape version of what we just talked about as um, they pointed out earlier. Uh, we did want to make sure we have plenty of shade along there and we also widen the sidewalk quite a bit. We want that to be a pedestrian experience. So our, our, our uh, tenants of the live workspace, we're encouraging them to put cafe tables and everything out there and we want that to be a gathering uh, place for people. Another important thing to point out is that on either corner, we're going to have uh, uh, you know our signage, uh, the mid residences, so that it's uh, very visible from, from either direction if you're heading north or south on uh, on Dixie. Uh, this is your view as if you're heading um, south. Uh, as you can see, uh, we do have um, signage for the live work. So we're going to make that uniform. <laughs> and uh, uh, but make sure that we, we give everybody a, a, an opportunity to have, you know, properly advertise um, their their space. 
Um, this is just a, a larger overview of, of the project, uh, bird's eye view, if you will. Uh, as you can see, we're located right next to a uh, uh, self-storage, which is great. So we don't have to build a bunch of storage, which uh, folks are kind of accustomed to. Uh, it's right across the street. This is uh, the view kind of, uh, again, heading east. As you can see, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're well situated here east. And uh, this gives you a good view of, of uh, the carports. Another big thing, uh, we, we wanted to add the carports closest into the buildings. The reason we did that was for, for two purposes. Number one, you know, it rains in South Florida. We wanted to provide plenty of shade opportunities for folks uh, uh, to park there and then also to give them some protection from the elements. One of the other big reasons, again, was that line of sight that we have people who are going to be on the second, third floor on their balconies. We don't want them looking at pavement. We don't want them looking at cars. So it's a little bit of a cleaner uh, look uh, for them to have. You know, we talked about maybe doing some kind of mural on top of there or something like that. Um, but, uh, but that was the other reason for the carports. Um, this is our clubhouse, so our view. One of, the, one of the big things too is we wanted to provide kind of a gateway through to the commercial. So as you enter, as you park, um, you know, in between the buildings here, uh, you'll actually enter in uh, to the commercial space through a breezeway, which is where this view is headed. So uh, a picture, you're looking west now, but if you were going east, you would go through a breezeway, which would lead you to uh, the commercial space uh, on either side. Uh, this is the uh, inside uh, clubhouse view. So one of the big things that, that we love about this project is, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, that we were we, we were creating an urban atmosphere. This is east. This is an urban environment. Um, uh, we're going to do a stained concrete flooring, um, uh, a lot of earthy type elements that people are accustomed to. We wanted to create. We didn't want this to be another garden style product. We wanted it to be a little bit edgy. One of the great things about Lake Worth is that it has its own personality. And, and we wanted to embrace that. And so I think our, our designers did a really great job of that. They did a live wall on the side there. We're also gonna have, um, uh, this, this space is meant to be multiple purpose. So it's not just your lobby. We, ha we actually have mail rooms and uh, storage lockers, or not storage lockers, sorry, uh, parcel lockers for Amazon delivery. <laughs> Thing that that's very popular these days. Um, instead of uh, when you typically go into an apartment building, you head down a hallway and you go into some dark corner and that's your mail, right? We wanted to put it out in the open. Again, another uh, opportunity for us to get people to interact with each other. So actually the, the mail and all that will be out front. Um, it's also kind of our live work type space. So we want to encourage people that may be renting a, a two bedroom right now and using that second bedroom as an office. Uh, to downsize and go to a one bedroom and have a place outside of their home that they can come to um, and, and, and work. Uh, this actually has two separate conference rooms that they'll be able to, our tenants will be able to reserve. And that way, if they want to host a meeting or put on a presentation or something like that, uh, they're encouraged to do that here. Again, more social interaction. Uh, another thing that we're going to have, or a couple elements that we're going to have in the uh, clubhouse is a yoga studio. Um, a, a fitness center with, uh, with uh, free weights and machines and um, a clubhouse space that people can rent out for parties and events. Um, that will be towards the back, ma you know, mainly towards the pool areas. A lot of that will be you know, more interactive. Um, this just gives you some of the um, uh, you know, elevations. As you can see from the uh, FEC railway, we are, we are intending on doing about a 10 foot uh, privacy and soundproofing wall to be able to provide us with with uh, plenty of soundproofing from the train track there and obviously added security uh, as well. So I'm, I'm that's it. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay. Um, at this point, does city staff have any questions for the applicant? No, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Does any member of the public wish to make a public comment? I have some cards here. Are there any more? Okay, I have Nancy Starr, followed by Robert Sterling, and then followed by Donna Winter Levin. Just please state your name and address for the record before you start. Nancy Starr, 1429 North J Terrace. Um, first of all, nobody knows about this development who lives around there. 400 feet 
notice is not adequate. And the only reason why I know about it is because I have a friend who lives on J Street. I live one over. There is too much traffic already on 16th. I don't know if there's been a traffic study done there, but I mean, there's been numerous accidents, fatal accidents. 16th is a go between Dixie and Federal. People just fly up it. Um, for that particular area, this development, I'm not against the development, it's just too much. 230 apartments with only 299 parking spaces, including the retail. That's just not adequate. It's too much for there. Um, that, that, that's what I'm basically against. It's just too much. 230 apartments. I mean, why does it have to be that many? And parking is already, there is a bar across the road. They have no parking. 16th at between J, J Street and Dixie, bottleneck. There has been numerous fatal accidents there. It's every day. Um, that's really about my biggest, um, I guess, uh, being against this, is this is too many apartments. And I don't know why there has to be that many. And if, and if, if there was a traffic study done on that particular area. Um, I'm sorry, we're following this this format, and I can't interact with you okay, during okay, it. I'm sorry, okay. but we'll we'll get and to our questions one, I, as afterwards. As far as I know, the one bedrooms are eleven hundred dollars. Um, I mean, you got Dixie, and then railroad tracks, and a um, not a really nice neighborhood right there. Okay, I mean, it's not some ritzy neighborhood. Then you got the then you got the storage place. Eleven hundred dollars for a one bedroom is kind of up there. I don't know if they're going to get it. Um, Thank you. They're I'm limited sorry. to one parking space. Thank you. I'm sorry when the timer goes off. I have. Time. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Robert Sterling, followed by Donna Winter Levin. Robert Sterling, 1506 North J Terrace. Um, I have the same concerns about the traffic, and I'm just wondering if anyone has done the due diligence of a traffic study in the area because there have been many serious traffic accidents in the area, uh, 16th and Dixie and 13th and Dixie. Uh, adding 230 apartments to the area is going to add huge amounts of traffic to the area. I work down in Miami. In Miami, they make this mistake all the time. There's no, you can't drive anywhere. It's traffic jams everywhere, accidents everywhere. Emergency personnel can't get through because of the traffic. Uh, I just think this is a really bad idea way too many apartments they need to scale it down this should not be approved this should be looked into this should be the due diligence of a traffic study thank you thank you donna what's your eleven? my name is donna winter Levin. i live at 1609 j terrace and i have a problem with the building I have a problem because it's going to bring a lot of people the traffic nancy had said actually everything that needed to be said a lot of accidents right there where we live on the corner by the bar um i think lake work doesn't need more apartments i think they need to focus on apartments that need to be fixed up there's a lot of houses that are run down still um i feel lake work needs a movie theater <coughs> another shopping center meaning a target something um, an oldie, not a public, to go all the way towards town if you don't go that way, or all the way to West Palm to go to uh, uh, Wind Dixie. I feel they need a store or a movie theater or something like that. I feel they don't need any apartments. We don't need that traffic over there. I live in Lake Worth 10 years, and it's getting worse and worse instead of better and better. Things are getting fixed up, other things are falling apart. While other things are falling apart, other things are getting fixed up. So I think there's other things that's more important than bringing people into Lake Worth. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, does any of the commissioners have questions for staff or the applicant? I see Commissioner Hardy, you have your light on. Um, yes, I do. Um, so I'll start with trees um, for the applicant. Um, so I'm seeing two different things um, on one of the renderings and it was the overhead rendering. I saw um, 
sidewalk between the trees in the street. And it was one of the first slides in the presentation. And on another, <coughs> I saw no space between the shade trees and the street, which is my preference, which is a completely protected experience. Yeah, so right there, you see on the Dixie Highway, on the, on the, on the building's front side, you see a little sidewalk space between the trees and Dixie Highway. Yes. And in another part of the rendering, if you go forward a little bit, go like, like go forward a few more slides there and even go, go forward a, a few more there. Okay. I missed it. Yeah. So my, my question is, and I don't really know, well, this is partly you if you're willing to do it. And this is partly the city, if we can do it, I would like to provide a completely protected experience for the pedestrian, right? So ideally what you would have is curb street tree, and then a sidewalk where the pedestrian can walk in between the tree and the um the building is it possible that we can move the street trees closer to the street and eliminate entirely the area of the sidewalk that's in between the um the street trees in the street uh, so so commissioner i'd like to make one point uh so this rendering was done a long time ago these these uh the landscape plans have advanced uh further than okay. our, our rendering so um when we actually look at the landscape plan, the one that you pointed out right there is is uh, you know more accurate to um, what we currently have uh, you know today. So we wanted to make sure we added a lot more shade trees in there. The rendering has other kinds of trees that we're we're obviously not um, going to be using. It, or, can I ask staff's position on first of all the feasibility and whether or not it would actually be a good thing to provide a completely protected experience for the pedestrian to move the trees closer to the street so that the only walking space is you know where you have a tree in between you and traffic that, that is something that we can definitely look at currently what you see right now there are two sidewalks one right. immediately adjacent to the street and then one internal so you're asking us to remove we're asking the applicant to remove the sidewalk that's out along the, right. the street right away and move it the pedestrian experience internal to the the site itself correct okay well, i would want to know i mean it's it's it's, it's it's just a thought i mean okay. you know right now we basically have two different sidewalks and it would be nice to have one really wide sidewalk that is completely protected from oncoming traffic yeah, here, by so. the um, trees. And I don't know if that's feasible or possible. I understand in some cities, that's the experience. Um, and in some cities, that's not the experience. I read we, that we, we had to have a bike lane on that roadway. <laughs> it, would be, it would be nice. Now that's no, something that, for that the roadway, suck. but it would be, it would be very nice sidewalk. to have a, a bike lane, even a protected bike lane. Before I commit to here, I'll say uh, <laughs> we, we will talk with the other departments and, work and talk with the applicant and see if that's feasible. We can bring a comment back to you at the next meeting, but this is a state road. So the DOT would be involved as well. Okay. I would just say in just in relationship to that, knowing what the you know, knowing that we're looking at um, the county doing an update of Dixie Highway corridor, mm -hmm. I would say that the more square footage we can leave in the plans to create protected bike lanes or better passenger or walkway systems or whatever they might be, it's better for us to to leave more space for the for a transformation of Dixie Highway in the future. You that, know what I mean? That is a, a consideration. I guess uh, my that, question. Keep that in mind. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I guess my second question would be: How wide is the sidewalk area between the um, trees in your building? I, I think it varies. So, so obviously, we have areas that lead to the commercial space that obviously have a lot more. Um, I'm I'm not 100 percent certain on this, but I want to say like roughly 15. I think it's about 15 feet, feet. Okay. and it varies, that's, and, and that's, there are some yeah. space to be dedicated to outdoor dining space. Sure. But there will be a clear pedestrian path through there as well. So there will be at least six, eight feet, seven feet for probably, the yeah. pedestrian? Okay, about seven feet. All right, that's, um, that's certainly adequate. Um, my second question is, along 16th Avenue and 17th Avenue, um, does the ratio of shade trees that you have in the front, like shades to palms, does that hold for 16th and 17th? I think that we, I think we ended up putting more along uh, Dexy uh, than we did because we felt like that was going to be more travel. As, as you know, uh, sure. Commissioner Sixteenth is is a dead end street, and on the other side of us, we have a, uh, a self storage which doesn't get a lot of pedestrian uh, foot traffic. Uh, you know, one of the other things we wanted to make sure we did was provide ample parking. That was one of the things we were squeezed on quite a bit, so we wanted to give ourselves as much. Uh, street side parking is, is you know as we could uh, along there cool 
Um, thank you. And for the amenity island, um, are we talking about actual sod or are we talking about turf or artificial turf? Turf. Uh, like artificial turf? Well, yeah, we're looking at the, uh, you know, the, the good stuff that you can't, uh, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's hard to tell the difference. But we prefer the turf. Um, one of the downsides to the turf is that, um, uh, you know, it gets a little hot. So, and which is why we wanted to make sure we had plenty of trees around there to provide ample, you know, shade uh, to be out there. Uh, obviously, one of the benefits to the to the turf is uh, just from a maintenance perspective, sure. and um, and uh, obviously we're using less uh, resources uh, sure. as well. Okay, um, and your front setback is twenty feet. I just want to be clear about that. I, I believe so. Is it twenty? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk about the size of each commercial space? So those uh, commercial space, uh, the commercial space is gonna vary from anywhere from about uh, just over 500 square feet all the way up to like 1200 square feet. Okay, so these are relatively small commercial spaces. They're, they're smaller commercial space. So we, again, we want a good, you know, mix of folks, in, you know, whether it's an art gallery, uh, a juice shop, a, uh, a fitness studio, a cafe, you know, if somebody comes in and they say, hey, you know, we want this space and the space next to them. You know, that's something we would consider as well. Um, we would just have to make sure that the, the door accessing the live, you know, part of that was going to be adequate or, or uh, was going to be uh, secure. Sure. Um, I, I'll, I, I'll uh, definitely commend you on that. I think there are lots of mixed use projects all around South Florida and probably all around the country um, where you have lots of vacant storefront space, not necessarily right. because there isn't a demand for right. the commercial space, but because the demand can absorb it in the large chunks that developers like to provide it. Sure. So I, I will commend you for having smaller spaces that mom and pop businesses um, and small businesses can occupy um, at rents that would probably be quite affordable. Um, right. uh, my uh, last question to you is, um, to your knowledge, and I understand that you've probably done lots of market studies um, before coming into this. You've you've probably spent a considerable sum of money acquiring the property, and you're probably, uh, should you be approved, would, would have to spend a considerable sum of money uh, developing the property. Um, to your knowledge, um, how many luxury apartment units are there in Lake Worth? Um, so east of 95, I believe there's one. West of 95, you know, probably there's there's probably two. To three maybe mm -hmm. um, so there's not it would appear many products like this in our city is that your opinion correct yeah we, we, we got a demand study uh which you know usually especially right now in south florida you drive around there's cranes everywhere and and uh, our financing partners like to really focus on these demand studies and uh they were jumping up and down when they got the demand study because there's ample demand for this type of product um uh you know within this market so okay so there's ample demand not a lot of supply correct okay yeah um and uh, could you just talk about the rents for each type of unit sure so our, our one bedrooms are going to be you know be at about eleven hundred dollars a month our two bedrooms are going to be closer to you know fourteen hundred dollars a month okay so if you're renting a one bedroom there and the unit's going to be affordable to you you basically have to make about three thousand dollars a month after taxes pretty much i mean it's normally a, a multiple of three you know the rent's got to be like a third of your income right so we're talking about people who are making um a considerable sum of money who would live in these one bedrooms and even more who would be living in these two bedrooms sure yeah i mean we think it's you know we think we're going to have a good mix of, of of tenants um you know in fact we spent a lot of time with our our management company talking about who we're going to be marketing the product to i think we're going to get everybody from uh, folks that are maybe working downtown west palm beach that uh, want to live in Lake Worth and, and are looking for this type of product to folks that are currently residing uh, in, in Lake Worth that want newer uh, product. Um, I think we're going to get everybody from young professionals to uh, empty nesters. I think we're going to see people move. You know, one of the things is this is east. You know, people want to be east. They want to be close to downtown. They want to be close to a lot of the amenities that, that Lake Worth, beach, everything else. So. I think we're going to get a lot of folks that see this as an opportunity to move east and, and live in a nice place, and and it's going to be attainable for a lot of folks. For the record, I'll state that um, the median household income for um, folks in my district is a, a lot less than, which is, and this project is in my district, is a lot less than $40,000 a year. Um, so this is certainly accretive from um, uh, the standpoint of our demographics 
And um, you know, I'll just I'll just make one last comment. It was said that we don't need um, more apartment units. Um, I think the evidence would show that there are very few apartment units like this in Lake Worth. Um, it was also said that what we need are things like movie theaters and more commercial space, grocery stores and things like that. I would say that those things follow rooftops, right? Until we have a sort of critical mass of, of people in the city that have money in their pocket, uh, we will not get movie theaters. We will not get your, your, your nice, fast, casual places to eat that they have in other cities to the north and to the south. We will not get um, you know, a, a, a finer grocery stores. We, we just won't get it until we get people in the city that have money in their pockets that are ready to spend, that are going to make it a no-brainer for a business person to locate their business here. So those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. This, these questions are directed primarily to staff. Uh, could you explain for the record, please, the, the public notification for a project such as this, uh, the, the time frames involved, the distance and everything else? Sure. Um, this has been advertised um, twice now. The third advertisement in the newspaper will go out for the second meeting. Um, the property was posted and a, per our code, a letter was sent to the 400 foot radius around the, for all the property owners surrounding the area, 400 foot radius. And I believe the development team also has met with the neighborhood associations. Yes. And, and tried to coordinate with them as well. Yes, so we, we did have meetings commissioner with uh, the Sunset Ridge neighborhood and Eden Place neighborhood associations. How many individual notices were mailed out to property owners within 400 feet? I don't have the, the count right in front of me, but I can get that for you if you'd like for the next second reading. Okay. Um, and the timing of these notices, when, how much time, uh, how long ago were these notices sent out? Um, the first mailing has to be out at least 10 days prior to the first meeting, which was the planning and zoning meeting in September. So it was 10 days prior to that meeting. Okay. So here we are. It's October. So the project had progressed to the point where, you know, we got pretty much well well into the development stage of this project and then we notify the public is that what i'm hearing um no, i'm not sure your, your comment we we sent it out prior to the planning and zoning board it was in the newspaper and then again the property was posted properly according to the the law okay um prior to that was there any other public meetings on this no okay. i mean other than going to the neighborhoods and have you received any feedback any written feedback from the public on this project we've not got any direct um comments from to staff on this comment on so this the purpose of the notice is to put folks make them aware of what's going on and give them an opportunity to weigh in uh and when, when would that opportunity be would it be just if i got a notice at my home I could just write a letter at that point, or am I invited to a meeting? How, what, what, what are we asking folks to do? The, the notice lets people be aware that the, that the project is coming forward. Um, it was properly advertised, and if people are paying attention to the agendas, it was on the agenda for the planning and zoning. It's on the agenda for this one tonight as well. Um, <coughs> both opportunities for people to come and make public comment. Okay, but there were, but you've received no written correspondence from anybody objecting or praising or you know in favor of okay that's all i need thank you vice mayor commissioner robinson uh, uh how many other developments have you done with the economic incentives that uh, we're providing so um we're uh, actually just uh, started moving around some dirt today down in fort lauderdale on a project where we we uh received similar type financing um, uh, we did one in Miami, uh, that's almost complete. We received similar type financing. And then I have about four in the Midwest that are you know, similar. When you say financing, you mean incentives? Incentives, correct. Okay. Yes. So, uh, was there any mention of solar on the, any surface? Yeah, actually, yes. But one of our incentive programs on this is, is through the, um, public utility and, um, being able to receive money based upon future, you know, utility usage. So um, we didn't make solar a big component of this, particularly because of that financing. It would be getting. Yeah, we're in the business. Uh, <laughs> so, right, but, right. Uh, we're also looking to the future of absolutely the environment. Sure. And one of the things I think that the carports present an, an option for, at least down the road, 
as the technology continues to advance is to, to provide um, potential, you know, solar up there. We do have flat roof, uh, which will, you know, allow us to do things in the future. We're also doing electronic uh, charging stations um, on this development. Um, I drive electric car and I think that's becoming more and more prevalent. So um, we try to encourage that. We also put the infrastructure in for it for future as, as that becomes, you know, uh, uh, more of a thing, then we'll be able to easily tap into that. One other, well, actually, uh, thank you for going to the neighborhood associations. What well, you'll have, probably have enough membership to have your own neighborhood association. <laughs> uh, the square footage rates for commercial, what what are they going to be? So we're going to be averaging. I think we're going to be right around uh, thirteen to fourteen dollars a square foot on our commercial. Is what that's going to average. That's uh, com annual. That's annual. Yes, yes. and that's that's. Uh, in the, the mid range of the market rate or is that the low end? I think that's on the low end from yeah. what we found in terms of comparable. And the reason we do that is it's a, it's a loss leader for us, but it's so important to the 230 residents that are, are renting there. You know, Could we you clarify, I've heard three different, I've heard 320, 420, and now 230. 230 units. 230, okay. Right. Right. Just, I just want to, for the record. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, so yeah, we want to make sure, to give you an example, we did a project uh, in, in, in an area that uh, there wasn't currently a lot of development going on. We had a bank, uh, it was about 7,500 square feet of commercial space. We had a bank come to us and say they wanted to rent for 30 bucks a square. Well, a bank closes down at five o'clock at night and on the weekends, they're closed down. The majority of our residents are gonna be coming home from work at five o'clock and they're gonna want something to do. So we didn't feel like that was a good fit. Uh, we talked a restaurant into leasing space from us at 22 bucks a square foot, which is significantly less, but we felt like it was important, you know, an important amenity for our tenants. And so uh, this, that same uh, type of mentality has been, been uh, used here. We want to make sure we're giving people an opportunity to have an affordable place. If, if that place is vacant because they didn't succeed, then we've kind of failed them in a way, right? And so we want to make sure there's plenty of activity out there along that uh, that commercial corridor. And you're not offering waterfront, oceanfront property. Correct. <laughs> not until the sea level uh, rises. Sea level rises. <laughs> and I, I just want to thank you for investing in Lake Worth. There you um, go. I uh, good met with you a while back and it, it's nice to see some of the recommendations. One was smaller retail space mm -hmm. um, at something that was more affordable um, walkable, sustainable. So thank you. I mean, it, it's everything that, you know, we talked about and everything that um, I think Lake Worth needs. And we've talked about um, Lake Worth not needing more rental. Lake Worth needs affordable, sustainable housing that's not substandard housing. Yeah. So the way I look at it, by bringing in something like this, it will force other landlords to step up or get out right. because you're giving them a better product and and somewhere nicer to live and it's only going to you know have the you do it on one block somebody's going to do it on the next block and and dixie corridor has needed help for years and years and joan and i way back when i sat on the cra board you know we talked about what can we do for dixie highway so you know this is the first piece of um, the renovation and i thank you for for taking um, the shot on Lake Worth, so to speak, and, and coming in and supporting us. I wanted to talk for a moment on the sidewalk. Um, the, the only thing that I ask staff is looking at the sidewalk. I agree with the mayor. Um, as DOT comes in with um, their ideas down, the, we had always talked about one consistent sidewalk all the way down. And if you want it to be walkable, sustainable, um, bikeable, people still ride on the sidewalk. Um, you know, it, I, and I think of Greg Rice, he's not here tonight, but he'll need a sidewalk that is consistent from downtown all the way down Dixie Highway. And if you're moving it from one side to the other, and I, I understand not, ha I understand having the buffer from the traffic, but if, if it's not consistent for someone um, all the way down Dixie Highway or, or going to school or anything else that may pop up, um, on Dixie Highway. I, I know we have a charter school down there. So um, just take that into consideration as we look and make sure that whatever it is, it's consistent. And then, you know, when DOT comes in, <coughs> make sure that, you know, it's comfortable because there's only so much we can do there. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. Just, I just want to address some questions before I give you a round two. Um, three people came up and talked about a traffic study. Was there a traffic study done in that area? There, there was a traffic study completed. And the other important factor to note here is that um, all the traffic studies and all of the traffic impact statements are reviewed by the county tra and traffic department. Uh, we do have the county's letter that says that this project does meet their standards. Understand that east of 95 is a residential exception area. So any residential traffic, this, any traffic generated by residential development is looked at differently than commercial traffic. So those projects east of 95 are in basically a countywide from north all the way down south, a traffic um, residential exception area. So the, the impacts of the residential traffic are not counted towards um, the needed improvements on the area. Um, so they look at just the commercial traffic. That being said, a traffic study was done to analyze the full impact of the traffic of all 230, to be clear, 230 residential units and 9,700 square feet of commercial <coughs> space. And for the record, it'll generate just under 1,700 trips a day is the estimated um, traffic impact on the Dixie Highway. Now, the question I have for you is when a project happens, uh, the last one I can think of on the Dixie Corridor was the courtyards of Lake Worth, the most recent, I guess, of, of new developments. Is is there, pardon me, what? Hammond Park. Hammond Park. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm thinking of that one in that specific area because it's so residential. The people that came up and mentioned something said J Street or J Terrace. J Terrace. Whatever. That's on the east side. That's on the opposite side of where the project right. is happening. That's correct. Correct. But the traffic coming out onto Dixie is going to be an issue from the east side. I'm assuming that's what the concern was. I know when the courtyards went up, a traffic signal went up in regards to that because of the amount of trips and whatnot. I just want to start thinking proactively as we start to talk of new development. Let's think long term. Now we know, okay, 1,700 cars is what you're saying. So now a traffic signal at a development that's now going to have 230 instead of 420. Um, 230 units and the traffic going in there. Yes, you've got 16th and you've got 17th. So one of those would have to be an intersection street. Now let's look at the capacity. We know that once you put a signal light on the, I happen to live in that area a little bit further north, but we know the traffic will tend to go down the street with an intersection because it's an easier access place from some, and some will avoid those intersect, those lights streets to get out when they're making a right turn. Left turns will come down that way. So as we start to do our complete streets through our neighborhoods, start to look, okay, if say, 16th is going to be the road where the signal is on. Let's talk, or 17th is going to be the road where a signal is on. Let's look at what the impact is going to be on the east side of Dixie Highway, right. meaning traffic signal like they did on Fordham in College Park has a, as a, uh, roundabout. a roundabout through the middle to make sure that the traffic doesn't go speeding down the residential streets if you're going to have an impact of traffic. I just want us to start thinking like this, not just in the direct area of impact, right. but also on the other side of impact so that because we're spending this money now on the bond, let's be proactive about, I'm sorry, I'm showing my Italian today. Mm -hmm. I'm really like talking in my hands. hands. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hardy first. I saw his light go on and then. Yep. I'm sorry. I had um, two questions, one for the applicant, one for staff. Uh, first one for the applicant. Are you providing covered bike racks for the residents? Yeah, so so we'll have internal uh, bike storage uh, closer to the sidewalk area uh, so that the folks as they're going out. Uh, again, one of the big things we want to do is focus on providing people with alternative means of transportation. Yes. <laughs> right on a bus, you know, the bus stops right out front. Um, you know, we're actually going to be purchasing bicycles for use of our tenants so they can just go in uh, check them out at no cost and use them. They'll have nice mid logos on the side of them and we're hoping people see them up and down Dixie. Um, so we, we wanted to provide plenty of that, but it'll be on the uh, furthest east building as you're exiting towards the uh, um, sidewalks. Thank you. Do you mind me asking how many, uh, basically like how much bike storage are you providing? I mean, is it is it gonna be at least for, let's say a fifth or a sixth of the residents, right? Yeah, we're providing a, a, a lot of outdoor bike, which is not convenient for folks, and I understand that. Um, so, 
Uh, we're actually trying to take up more space right now in some of our electrical rooms. So that's still kind of a work in progress. Um, if we can use more of our electrical room space for bike storage, you know, we're going to do so. Um, I think there's a there's also a number of, of people uh, in our experience in these developments that if they go out and they spend, you know, several hundred dollars on a brand new bike, they're not going to leave them in the the you know uh, shared uh, space because they end up usually getting damaged while somebody's trying to rip their bicycle out of there. So we we also think we are going to have you know a handful of people that are just you know they're going to take it up to their unit or. Uh, uh, you know, store it elsewhere. Sure, thank you. Um, my question to staff would be, can you tell me whether or not PNZ approved this unanimously? I was there, but I don't remember the breakdown of the vote. I, I want to say yes, but let me just verify that for you. Okay. I was yes. how was how, why, how we opened this presentation. I, I, I might have missed that. While we're um, waiting for that, can I ask you, are you paying impact fees to the county on this project? Yes. Oh, yeah. do, you, do you mind me asking um, how much are the impact fees that you're paying to the county? $1.4 million. $1 million. Okay, Madam Mayor, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think we should explore the possibility of a signalized intersection on either 16th Avenue North or 17th Avenue North and Dixie you. Highway. I agree with you wholeheartedly on um, looking at the um, regional or semi-regional impacts to this, um, what's going to happen across Dixie Highway. We do have a grid system which disperses traffic, um, which means that probably some traffic is going to go through neighborhoods. That what That's what a grid system is for. Um, but I think we need to, I'm all for slowing traffic down as, as much as possible. So I'm sorry, say that number again, one point, how many million? Four million. Wow. Okay. Madam Mayor, can you tell um, everyone here of the impact fee money that has gone out of Lake Worth to the county over the last so many years, how much of that money has come back to Lake Worth? I think it's about... Well, with what's happening now on um, Batwell, not not including let's, Batwell. Yeah, yeah. Let's okay. not include Batwell. Not including Prior Batwell. To. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. What was it about like like thirty thousand dollars? Thirty thousand. Th there was like a ten thousand dollar one interchange right. and, and another. Yeah, about thirty thousand. Out of yeah. out of how many millions that have left Lake Worth over the past several years? <laughs> Hundreds of millions. Okay. So I I think it's really important. Oh, oh, of lift Lake Worth. I'm sorry. Yes. No. Yeah. No, but remember. Our money is shared in other communities. Precisely. So every Precisely. city's, every community's money is shared in other communities, Precisely. and some of them are just spend more in their own communities. But we have yet to take advantage of the impact fee in our community. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would put it just a little differently. I think the folks who have, who are in control of that process, have not put together a fair system for cities like ours, communities that are to the east, that generate a lot of impact fee revenue, and then somehow that impact fee revenue gets magically shifted west of here where infrastructure is needed, where people continue to move, and we're left with, with nothing. And so I, I think, and you have been the, our number one champion on getting our impact fee money back. I think this is a prime opportunity for us through the TPA and, 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 and to, to, to get some of that money back in the, in the form of a, a signalized intersection. I'm scrappy. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, we're, I, it is just so, you know, I, I sit there and I, I, I try not to, you know, I, People think I'm such a nice person, but once I get so frustrated with our money going out of there, I just get so irate, and I feel like every time I go into those meetings, I'm like a kid storming, you know, pounding my fist down and stubbing my feet. But remember, I brought this up, a new audience, you know, so many times, remember what the push was. It was the push was to move west in gated communities and A-rated schools and, and kids and whatever, and that was then. And then they were planning these roadways. We're twenty. Their planning philosophies are twenty years ahead of time for the following twenty years. So guess what? Those kids grew up. Those parents are empty nesters, and they want to live east now. They don't want to live out west. And and the the money is still being sent out there because twenty years ago they said they were going to need a flyover at State Road Seven and whatever. And now they have 14 lanes of traffic going both ways. The residents have built there. If they don't want to fly over, they've already got enough traffic. And guess what? That money has been earmarked for that neighborhood. We need that money, and that's what I fight for all the time. We need that money to come back east because the trip. By the time the money catches up, people are already going to be moving here. We need that money to come east. They need to start focusing on Federal Highway and Dixie Highway. 
and our communities and creating, you know, and, and our east-west thoroughfares <laughs> off of 95 because we don't have highways like 595 in Fort Lauderdale and, and, and whatnot. We use our residential streets, the very same streets that yeah. people live on, Lake Worth Road and this and that. Those are our east-west connectors. So, oh, you got me started. No, I, you. hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, sorry. yes, it was a unanimous decision. By awesome. The so everyone who's on planning and zoning, which are members of the community, they're not elected officials, they all approve this. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. Thank you. My, my first uh, comment, or actually it's a question to our, our city attorney, Madam Attorney. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I may have erred earlier when I was asked about ex parte communication. I did meet with Mr. Burns many, many, many months ago, long before I believe this process began. I just want to make sure that I clear the record here. I met with him. I don't think he had anything formally proposed in front of the city at that time. So where does that put me in terms of going to jail tonight or whatever? <laughs> Bye. You have disclosed for the record your ex parte communication, if there was any, so you're good. You sure? Yes. I may you proceed without the bracelets. That's correct. <laughs> Don't even no, not, on well, this, not on this issue. Well, I just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 40 years, I'm quite sure something. Born of all. So, um, all right. Again, I, I don't recall that this process has formally begun, but just for the record, Thank I you. did meet with these folks. Um, I'm going to start with staff. You know, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that, you know, this is a special deal where we kind of, I'm using my words, we kind of bend the rules a little bit and kind of make things tweak a little bit differently so everything fits very nicely into this proposed development package. Now, my question is, now they're going to have mixed use. How much, how, how much have we lost in terms of our ability to regulate, for lack of a, a better word, the type of businesses that may go into these units? Have we lost that? Uh, does, the city, does the city still have to approve the type of business that might go into one of those units? Absolutely, 100%. Um, in their <clears throat> varying of the regulations, the, one of the things that we rarely would let somebody do is vary uses. So the uses are still subject to the, the underlying zoning district. Okay. And any any business that comes in would have to apply for a business license, and that business license would have to go through the full approval process and verify that that use is allowed within the zoning district. Okay, so the type of business that potentially would go into this development is based on what the city allows, not what developer or the management company would deem acceptable. Based on what the city allows within the Dixie Highway Zoning District, yes. Okay. Um, all right. We all know what type of business I don't particularly care for. So that's probably going to be my next question, but I'm going to pass on that for tonight. It's a very convenient of... question, sir. Yeah. No, <laughs> no convenience stores? <laughs> Tattoo shops? Pool halls? Pool halls? Correct. No, oh, there's trouble. Well, I'm serious. I am serious as a heart attack. Okay, and the reason I say that is the reason I say that, and the reason I bring this up is if I, if I heard correctly, I think that the number that was tossed about earlier was fourteen dollars a square foot. Right. So mm -hmm. annualized on a five hundred square foot unit, how much is that in rent? Right. How much is that? Six hundred fifty bucks a month. Right. That's dirt cheap. Yep. A lot of people could come up with some really creative sure. business models Concerned. they might want to put in one of those brand new Absolutely. commercial spaces. And, and again, I think I think this is the uh, the front door to our community. You know, I think um, you know. Hopefully, uh, you know, we're going to be attracting tenants that uh, are, you know are, are respectable uh, members of the community and and would typically you know be attracted to more um, I guess different uses. Okay. Um, so it, it wouldn't do much for our, you know, again, by discounting it, really the reason we're doing it is so we can select who's the best fit. The tattoo parlor, that doesn't really do anything for us being able to attract, well, you know, a tenant into the. Development. I would feel a lot more comfortable if there were some sort of a, a methodology that we have a conversation to make sure that there are certain types of business that we can assure will not go in there. What I'm you share with, okay with what you tell us tonight. Yeah. Could be a lot different if the market right. changes. Sure. Okay. Which brings me to my next question. That is the management company is going to be leasing out the space, both the, both the residential and the commercial side. Mm -hmm. In my mind's eye, if somebody comes and wants to use the mixed use piece of, of your development, there's two things they need to be looking at. The, the credit worthiness of the tenant, mm -hmm. the 
credit worthiness of the business. Yeah. How are they separated? How, how does that work? And how do we have assurances that we're not going to be leasing, that you're not going to be leasing space to somebody who's going to have a failed business model? Sure. That's not going to make it. We have the ability to, uh, just a question. Do we have the ability, I mean, we're talking about a private entity project. Yeah. I know what we can allow by our zoning and codes, but can we tell, I just want to, I, I say that only because my building, the landlord was initially told, even though it was allowed to, and I, my office is in the promenade building on Federal Highway, they were told that they could not have food establishments open in that downstairs unit. And that downstairs literally sat empty for a decade while they turned down Dunkin' Donuts and JJ's <coughs> subs or whatever, I mean, a million different places, because they were told by planning and zoning that they wouldn't get their approval unless they A, didn't allow food establishments and B, provided nighttime mm -hmm. parking for the businesses across the street. This is what our planning and zoning at that time did. So I, I, I just, I always err on the side of caution. I don't want to get into a private right. thing. And Sorry, Jamie, did you have something? Oh, okay. I, um, you know, I just, I, I like to private business to operate. We have some ways that we can just be protected. I like, I understand where you're going. I just want to make sure that we're not sitting here telling people you have to do this damn thing. No, and I'll be the first one. You've heard me consistently over the years speak to that very point. So that's not where I, I probably should have asked the question or phrased it differently. I guess what I'm saying to you is at the end of the day, these are going to be very affordable units to, to live in. Mm -hmm. And from a commercial standpoint, it doesn't seem like they're going to be terribly expensive to run out the, the commercial piece of this. Okay, um, I, I'm just telling you, I just, I, I, I'm a little uneasy here that we're going to have turnover maybe because of, of everybody that feels that this is my opportunity because I've got some really inexpensive commercial space. And you know what? I woke up today and I'm a widget master. I'm going to do, right. you know, right. I'm doing this today. Right. And they set up shop and they go through a process and boom, they're done. Yeah. So now what do you do? So, what do you do so, if the business goes defunct? Well, no, and, no. And the, you know. Uh, uh, Commissioner, number one, uh, you know, we're going to have one lease. So you're leasing the residential space with the commercial space. So there's no, we're not leasing the commercial space separate. So the, the, the folks that are signing a lease with us are living there uh, just just as well as they're, they're um, working there. Um, you know, we're going to put them through a process. And again, there's only 10 of these. So our management company is going to be responsible for 230 units, uh, 10 of which we're going to have as a development company oversight and because it, again, it is the front door of our of our community here, and we want to make sure that we're getting the right mix of, of tenants in. Um, we're going to put them through any, you know a, a process just like any other tenant, um, regardless of what the rent is, and make sure that their business model they, they've got they've got to show us that they have a track record. I mean, as much as we love uh, startups, um, if there was a startup that uh, that wanted to come in here and 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 we felt like there was a uh, they had a business model that was put in place and they, they had the financial wherewithal to do it, then that's something that we would consider. I think uh, you said it best. I think people are going to be lining up at the door for this space. And that's our hope is that we really have a lot of options and that will give us flexibility to make the best possible decision for the options that are not only going to be best for our community, but they're going to be good financial options for us. I mean, these, these folks are going to be signing annual leases. And um, they're going to be required to uh, go in. The, the, the space is going to be white box, so it's going to be, uh, you know, con stained concrete floor, uh, uh, drywall, exposed ductwork, exposed ceilings. So you you really got to be able to come in and spend some money to do that. So it's not just going to be I spend I give you my six hundred and fifty dollar check and we're off to the races. They're going to have to come in and spend some considerable investment in making sure that the space is built out appropriately. And, and, and last, we're going to have a, a common area maintenance, maintenance agreement. So all that space along the, fir, along the front there, they're all going to be responsible for their pro rata share of keep, keeping that clean. And um, so they're going to have additional financial uh, responsibilities uh, there. We're also going to be signing, uh, along with their lease, a, a non-compete. So making sure that, again, if, if, if you have a particular business that we're not opening your competitor next door and letting you guys... Uh, uh, compete against each other because that's a recipe for disaster and one of one of the businesses will fail and and that'll look bad on us sure i'm going to back off a little bit on where i was going with that but i, I do believe that um, it's important uh, to know that they will be responsible for the build out 
Yep. And the build out will be um, over, overseen, if you will, by the city. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So all the plumbing and all the other stuff has to be in intact. Yep. Yep. Now, the only other, other thing I want to talk about as far as this commercial space is concerned is I do believe we have in the book somewhere, I'm not sure how well we implement uh, this ordinance, but we have provisions in place that if you have a storefront that is vacant, it needs to be activated, covered in some form or fashion. Sure. And I think that this really needs to be uh, maybe included. I don't know if we can legally ask this, but it needs to be put into the lease that if that business goes to funk out of business or whatever, they must put something in that window. So when people drive by, they don't think, oh my God, look at this vacant space. Okay. Yeah. Um, and of course that is in accordance with our, our ordinances. Sure. Okay. So that's just, so I guess I'm asking staff or somebody legal, somebody tell me, is this something that we can yeah. ask for and receive as part of our decision-making here? If I can just jump in, we, you can make that a condition. We can add that to the condition of approval and make it part of the um, ordinance as, as uh, attachment C um, that way it'll be memorialized with this it is a requirement of the code but we can we can add that as a condition in as well and we well, can make that amendment from first and second reading right no the next piece of this is really going to be a breaking ball so everybody hang on so if we can do that that's wonderful but at the end of the day this becomes a code issue it becomes a code issue if the tenant fails to do this my question is what if any recourse could we possibly have or put in place to put the property and developer on notice that they are responsible for covering up those windows in the event that so they're, they're required anyway under the code um madam mayor yes. if i may they'll still be the owners of the property yeah. so under the code we could cite the owner which would be the bigger hammer okay. about not having the activated right. storefront all right very well so let's move through this item guys come on uh, well i do have another very important question okay okay <laughs> And this is a concern I raised with the city manager, and he's not here this evening. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about um, this project attracting new people into our city. And one of the questions I asked without getting into all how I got there was, well, okay, we have a lot of folks here in this city that are being abused, if you will, by their landlords. They live in substandard housing, and they're paying real money in many cases for this substandard housing. What assurance do we have that we're not going to have a transition of existing residents that are going to upgrade to a better situation, only to be backfilled by the existing that the where they leave to be backfilled with, you know, does that make sense? No. We're not. In other words, we're not really attracting any new 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 folks into the city. We're just kind of shifting our residents around. That's have you done a study to that effect? I mean, if you talked, to, have you uh, have looked at it from that angle? I mean, I, th I think the need is significant both with current current residents and and outside residents, uh, the folks that are that are currently residing in other in other cities. The need, um, the need too for the credit checks and evaluations and those things of that nature, whatever. You look many of the many of the quote slum landlords and things that you're dealing with. A lot of those facilities are on weekly basis where the basis where they're paying even more than a than some of the rents we heard discussed here. By the mm -hmm. time they pay their weekly rents. Um, that's our job and i think it's we're kind of getting out of the realm yeah. of the items that's on the agenda here tonight folks i mean we can analyze what development means for the community and have that in, in a workshop well, item definitely maybe that matter maybe that is a little bit off a little bit off uh the track but it is relevant in the sense that part of this conversation a big part of this conversation is the added value that brings and bringing in folks with more discretionary income that will be able to to position us in the future for a movie theater or a different type of commercial product Understood. down the road we and we we well we need those items they're walking out now but we the one thing is that the demographic studies that are done that we know that you know joe smith in chicago when he looks at his demographic research and we don't we don't show up like i said we we show up when when joe smith's and his wife and their children come down here to go visit the island of Palm Beach and they happen over the bridge and they say, what is this lovely town? Right. You know, why aren't I investing here in this lovely town? But the numbers still do not show us. And we are, as we start and we start to get infill and development and things of, those na of that nature, those numbers do not, from a marketing perspective, those numbers do not shine brightly on us 
from someone who has no knowledge or has ever been here before. And that's where, when we look at these projects, each project is a stepping stone of where the future goes next. Because we, as we draw in people in, and they draw in friends and relatives and people in to see what we see that live here and love it, um, that's how we build one brick at a time. Right. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, staff. And uh, real, real quick. So we talked about a light at 17. Um, I've only gotten one call on this project, at, but I get calls all the time because that's my district that people cut through on Dixie to Federal. Um, the people that are cutting through from Dixie to Federal, are the people that live in that eastern area, and you know, I know once the roads get done, we can look at street calming on on those roads. Um, but I would also concern. I, I would be concerned. I think there should be a street light, but I think we need to talk about it because you put a light right now, as I look at it, these people are coming out of the project. They're either gonna turn north or south. I use that storage unit on a regular basis. There is no way that I would consider going east across Dixie Highway. It takes you a couple minutes to turn north or south. So once you put that light in at 17th, you are actually giving them an access to cut through that neighborhood. Um, so once we do that, if we do that, we need to make sure that we look at the street calming that goes through that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is the bus stop being right out there. I think we need to have a serious conversation with Palm Tran about updating their location because you know, we've been fighting to try to bring the bus back to the beach. You know, who's going to pay for it? What's it going to look like? But I think we're putting a beautiful new project in. Palm Tran needs to step up and, and put something nice in that location. They don't, um, they don't do that. <clears throat> Cities do that. Well, but we still need, if all our money's going out, they need to, you know, and they're saving a lot of money on, you know, they've revamped and they've cut their, their services and things like that. We, we need to have a conversation. That's all I got. Commissioner Robinson. Uh, my question was in, in terms of management. Uh, you're going to be managing... Was was the management company part of your financing proposal? Uh, no. So so our management company is Alliance Residential. I believe they're the fifth largest uh, in in the country. Um, so the, we ha we hire a third party apartment manager. And they were weren't part of your uh, financing pre presentation to the bank. Or no. So uh, do you know any restrictions that they're going to have on any tenants? Are you going to allow there are no, there are, no restrictions. are you going to allow guns? Are you going to allow uh, subsidized oh. housing? Um, well, there's no subsidized uh, housing, um, but yes, I mean we'll have um, you know the lease that everybody signs. There's going to be restrictions to living living in that community. Um, you know, a lot of people ask if we have dog restrictions, breed restrictions. You know, I, I own a big breed dog, so I, I tend to say no, uh, so long as it's well behaved. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, weapons, firearms, stuff like that will, you know, obviously discourage. And, and I don't know, you know, again, we're going to be held to fair housing. So it's anything that we <coughs> tell people we can do or can't do has to comply with, with, with those laws. So if I have a voucher, I can, I can live there. Uh, if you have a voucher, um, uh, no, no. You, you can cannot. restrict, you're not getting any. Uh, well, uh, sorry. So it's it's not a project based voucher. So if you had a voucher and the housing authority was coming in, um, then that that would obviously be reviewed by our management company, and and it would be determined whether or not they wanted to take that lease based upon the credit of the tenant. So just like if if any tenant comes in, they're going to have to show us that they have the ability to pay rent, um, you know, for the property. Uh, but it is not a, a subsidized project. It's market rate. No, I didn't. I wasn't referring to that. I'm talking okay. about management because it's all about management. Yeah, there, there's uh, nothing that um, our you're management. Gonna be gone, you're going to be. You're 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 done after you build it. Well, no, not Your really. Management is what's going to affect the city. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and no, I mean, again, we're, we're long-term holders. Uh, we're a young company. We like to. Um, locate in areas that we think are going to just continue to improve over time. Um, you know, we, we take a look around, we have a lot of the surrounding properties that are vacant and we're making a big investment and taking, uh, you know, a, a significant deal of risk uh, by, by parking this kind of investment in this community. Um, I think 
it, that would be all for naught if we sold out within a couple of years. And we, we want to take this ride with you guys. We're long-term holders. Our management company knows that we like to hold these properties long-term. And that's why we, have an, uh, we actually have an asset manager that oversees the management company. If you don't do that, then, then not only are you going to run into problems such as, as you're saying, where, where they start doing things that maybe we wouldn't approve of, but um, we also need to make sure that we're running an efficient project and, and overseeing their, their daily financial. And Alliance support. manages any, any of your other projects? So uh, actually, they're going to be uh, our manager on our Fort Lauderdale deal, and that'll be the first project that we've worked with them um, on, on our Fort Lauderdale project. So it's a whole new management company for you? Correct. Yep. Okay. And then guys, um, come on, two hours. Yep. Uh, on last item. thing, thank just you. thank you for investing in Lake Worth. I think your project is going to do a lot of good. It's going to bring a lot of residents that we've been struggling to attract. Um, and um, uh, finally, there will be some comps <laughs> for people who are, are building things like, like what you're building, and I, I think that will help as well. So um, that's it. I'm ready to... Uh, okay. Madam Mayor, if, if I could quickly, and I, I apologize, um, I, I meant to, to mention the CRA as well. They were a, a key partner in this project moving forward, and I don't want to miss coming to Joan and her team uh, as being a partner with the city to, to bring this project forward. And also to Nick, um, just partner. Thank you. And I know Mike wanted to send his uh, congratulations um, and wish you guys the best of luck, and we were waiting for the ribbon cutting. Well, we got to vote first here, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That'd be um, nice. Yeah. Madam Mayor, uh, William Waters, Community Sustainability Director. There's one other um, request to add to the conditions of approval besides the one that Mark Stivers went over. In the development incentive that was approved back in May, there is a bit of language talking about the city manager being able to provide an extension of relief of 180 days. The applicant has requested that we also incorporate that same 180-day language so the two things actually work coincide um, as one of the conditions of approval. So we would request that on their behalf. Okay. All right, at this point, I'm closing the evidentiary part of the hearing. All right, is there any more last comments that commissioners well, would like to make? Commissioner we, Robinson? Mr. Waters mentioned the city manager's decision. I would uh, want to, I think the commission should, if there's any decision to be made in regards to extending, the city commission should uh, be at least aware of it, if not voting on it. Yeah, it would come back. It would come back. Okay. Okay, so we've closed down the evidentiary part of it. I'll ask for a motion. So moved. So moved. Moved by Vice Mayor Pro Tem Maxwell, seconded by Commissioner Hardy. Does that include the two additions to the conditions of approval? Yeah. Or now um, I have to ask the motion maker first. Repeat them for the record, please. What was the first one? The first one was the one that, uh, Mr. Maxwell, you brought up about the, the storefronts and making it a condition of approval that we hold the property owner accountable. Like, like the attorney has said, it is part it's of the code part. already. If we need to make that additional condition, I don't think there's a problem with it, but it's already in the code. The second one was the one that Mr. Waters has brought up, and that is the adding additional time on to the approval. Right now, um, our code gives them one year um, from the time of the approval to pull building permits. Um, as part of the ordinance, you'll see that they actually have additional time that lines it up with the economic incentive that went forward. They're asking for additional 180 days on top of that. So if we can make that part of it, then both of those would be extended out the 180 days additional time. We can pick that part of the ordinance and bring it back if for a second reading. It. If they need it. If they need it. It gives them a, 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 an outside line. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So That's you fine. make the motion. It does include that? Yes. Okay. Second. And second does include that? Yes. Yes. With, oh. with the understanding that uh, that decision is going to be by the commission or by the city manager? It'd be sold. part of the ordinance right now. So it would give them up to an additional 180 days on top of the. Uh, 720 days from May 1st is the way the, the ordinance is written. Um, so we, we tied the timeline of the development plan to the economic incentive that was approved back in May. So both of those timelines right now are walking together. It'd be 180 days on top of the um, 720 from the time that the economic incentive was approved. Again, that was May 1st. Madam Mayor, I, I believe the commissioner's question deals with who's the approval authority, and I believe under the incentive agreement, the city manager is the approval authority. But what we can do is make sure if there's an extension approved by the city manager, notification comes to the commission. Okay, so then make that yeah, then make that just part of the motion. So the original motion maker, will you include that as part of the motion? Well, only to to clarify the city manager's participation. So this will come to the commission prior to his authorization. 
or after the fact? No, after the way the incentive agreement is written is he has authority to approve an extension up to 180 days if they need it. So there's no point in him bringing it back if he has the authority to do what he wants to do. He could certainly notify this board that he has granted the extension. Basically, if you're approving it today here with that exception, you're basically saying they have approval if they need the extension to yeah. extend it. Yes. You're stating that publicly right now. All right, let's go. Okay, so the motion with that extent? Okay. That's fine. So the motion is seconded. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, gentlemen. Great, thank you. See you again in three weeks. Take a break. Thank you. Take a break. All right, we'll take a quick break, guys. We'll be right back. I'm sorry, did a miracle just happen? Did he just ask? <laughs>
Huh. Madam Mayor, it's 8.15. We're back live. Okay, let's resume. It's Tuesday, October 30th, special city commission meeting. And we're moving on to new business, item 11A, resolution number 70-2018, creating the economic investment incentive program. So moved. Second. I have a second. We can't discuss without sure. a second. Thank you very much. That's motioned by the vice mayor, seconded by Commissioner Robinson. We have any discussion or presentation? I'm just going to go over it real quickly. I'm William Waters, Community Sustainability Director. Um, as was alluded to uh, in the previous discussion, uh, the MID received an economic incentive investment um, package that was approved by the City Commission back in May. Uh, we also discussed um, formalizing that program at a workshop a couple weeks ago, and it's being brought forward to you tonight as a formal agenda item, as a resolution. Some of the more important components of it um, are two. The first one is that there are revenue-based incentives from the four utilities of the city, electric, water, sewer, and stormwater. The resolution does propose uh, the percentages of the first three years of revenue from those programs that could be offered as an incentive for a project of no less than 25,000 square feet. The rates that are offered um, for the incentive will be evaluated by the City Commission on an annualized basis. Some years you may be able to afford a, a better um, incentive, some years you may be able to afford only a lesser incentive. Uh, based on the utility studies that are done for those, utility rate studies that are done for those four utilities. The other component of the program is that if there is infrastructure needed to bring forward a project and that infrastructure has been funded and approved as part of the capital improvement program or plan of the city, that money can be forwarded up and put in place ahead of time um, on behalf of the developer. But that's only when it can happen. It does not, we're not going to be creating money, finding money for a developer for the infrastructure. So some developments may be able to partake of both incentives some developments may only qualify for the revenue-based incentive. And that's essentially the, the crux of it. Um, two important pieces that the city attorney's office has been very helpful in putting together are assurances that if infrastructure money is given or expended, the project that has been identified will be completed through a construction bond. And then on the revenue-based side, um, we're working on a performance bond, which when the money is paid out, if the project does not perform as anticipated, the performance bond might pay out and make up the difference. If the project does perform better than anticipated, we keep all that difference. So um, there are assurances that the city will not be out of money. Um, this is all based on new utilities and new accounts being set up due to a project coming into the city. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And just reiteration that the incentives don't take place until the actual project goes into service goes into service okay. that's how the what is for the mid um some of the infrastructure money may be paid up front to actually pay for the construction of some of the infrastructure in order to get the project finished but that um, is, as it's set up now there's two payment periods one to get it started the construction of infrastructure and the last part is paid when the infrastructure is actually completed okay nice mayor pro tem Thank you. You answered seventy-five percent of my question. I'm glad that there's a, a uh, construction bond and performance bond component to this uh, resolution. The question I have is: if we move a project up that's already been funded, identified and funded, we move a project up. Uh, there, there's basically two pieces that have to come into play here. Number one, the project has to be completed before the project. The other, the developer can do their job, right? Right. But you know, well, what happens if we move a project up and something happens and the project doesn't happen. Well, keep in mind that, that since that project that has been moved up was already approved to be constructed, it would be constructed in advance of its normal schedule. So it will it will serve a need of the city anyway. I get that, but it, 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 in, in theory, at the expense of somebody else if the project doesn't come online. So somebody else got, got put further back because of that project being considered. I can't answer that question directly, but as I understand the capital improvement program, the money is already in play, mm -hmm. and so it would not be at the expense of losing other infrastructure projects or postponing those. Well, then I don't understand what we're what we're doing here. I, I'm, I'm, I think what I'm hearing here is that if a capital project has been identified and funded, we have the funding in place. Mm -hmm. That in terms of actually construct or actually implementing that project, can be moved up. Right. It could be. It could be. Well. So what you're saying then is 
because everything's been funded. Nobody, nobody else is really. Uh, other projects, are, you, you unless have, of course it requires city staff or utilities or whatever, it kind of takes them out of the loop a little bit to, to do that project. It can. But our capital funds adhere to, I mean, we're, we decide the capital fund expenditures on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So if you're moving something around, you're really only talking about moving it around within that one year time period. Well, now so your that, capital improvement plan is actually a five year window. <clears throat> and many of your bond funds and other funding for infrastructure projects already scheduled out several years in advance. So this is only available if the money and the projects are already part of that adopted plan. Okay. I don't want to, I just, my concern was that somehow somebody or somewhere is, is going to maybe get no. put off a little bit time-wise because of, you know, this type of a project. And, and my concern was if that is the case, what happens if the project As envision is only speeding up a project, which does not delay other ones. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. Commissioner Hardy. Yep. Um, I'll just reiterate the concern that I had, which is I, I feel that if we're providing an incentive to development, which I think is a smart thing to do, um, I think we should perhaps be a little picky and choosy about um, the um, type of development that we provide incentives to. So I understand um, developments that qualify would be um, a new plan development that could be single use or mixed use, uh, mixed use development, residential plan development, which would obviously be single use and an urban plan development, which could be um, single use. And so I, look, is it is it something that's going to cause me to not vote for this? No, but what I wish was before me was an incentive that um, um, was for the best projects, which are, in my opinion, of you know a, a a mixed use. And I'm wondering, is there a way that we can provide a larger incentive to a mixed use project than we would, you know, for example, um, in Section H here, we, you know, we'll give you up to 20% for the electric utility, two and a half percent for the water and sewer utilities each, and 25% and for the stormwater utility. Is there a way that we can kind of bifurcate that and basically say, if you're doing a mixed use project, we'll give you the full 20, but if you're doing a single use project, um, which obviously does not enhance the walkability of the city, and you know, a few other things um, that we won't give you the full 20, we'll give you say 15 on the electric utility and say, you know, 15 on the stormwater. I mean, is that something that you? Well, would consider prudent. I think they're only based on usage, though. They're based on the types of uses. What we do have in another component, which is not directly a piece of this, is in our comprehensive plan. There are additional incentives in regards to height, density, intensity. If you do a mixed-use project in a TOD area, in Anywhere. whatever you okay. put that either urban plan development, plan development, mixed-use plan development, there are additional incentives for additional development if you go mixed use. Um, if you do a single use, it might just be in like an industrial area. I don't know how we would actually, we do want to encourage industrial uses to come into the city, but that is not one where we want to encourage housing or some other type of use that would make it more than one use. So, you know, those are non-financial incentives. Um, those are basically, we will give you greater entitlement to the property. If you if you do a mixed use, I guess you know my, my, my thing is if if the taxpayers or if the utilities are going to miss money, um, my hope would that it would be missing money for literally the very very best of projects. That's that that's not saying that good projects shouldn't be incentivized. My 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 hope and my belief is that we should provide more incentives to the very best projects, which are in my opinion mixed use, and with, that we should perhaps provide not as many incentives or as much of an incentive for projects that are single use well, in nature. I, I would venture to say this, not every mixed use project is an excellent project just because it's mixed use. I would, I would say that And that's so true. there is yes. a vetting process by which it goes through staff, the site plan review team, it will go through one of the advisory boards, either Historic Resource Preservation Board or sure. the Planning and Zoning Board, and it will come to you because these are all planned developments that can qualify this. It will go through the same process as the mid. Sure. So we can whittle out and weed out the developments that we do not find that meet the criteria which we want. Not every project that comes along is going to meet all the criteria for both, both being a planned development, a good project that meets the requirements of land development code, and is warranting of the economic incentive. It's not a buy or right automatic thing. I, this I understand. I just wish that there was a more automatic winnowing process before it got to us. But I, you know, I'm supporting this ordinance. I just wish it were a little different. Well, this this um, resolution, I should say. My support it really comes based on these two guys sitting in the back of the room right now, which is water and electric. If you're comfortable 
with the incentive program, that's number one that I would ask because you're the ones challenged with the budgetary constraints every single year and you know what we're trying to do with rate parity and all of those things. If you feel that this based on performance is viable, then then I can definitely be in support of that. The other thing to add to that is that the, is to add to that is to keep in mind that because this is based on the usage, so when you're introducing a new a new project, whatever that is, that is in essence customers that are currently not on the grid. Okay, so so they're new customers. So it's not like you're taking anything. You're not losing money that we had before. You're incentivizing projects to create more business. The fact is if they don't perform, that's where I personally feel comfortable with having that performance bond in there that that protects us if they should not perform as well as expected. So you yeah. guys feel confident about sure. this? Sure, Brian Shields, Water Utility Director. I'll let Ed speak on the electric side. I'm uh, perfectly comfortable with this. When we looked at two components, First was the revenue side, so we know we're going to get additional revenue by new customers. So we have some wiggle room in our rates that we're able to offer the developer as an incentive. So no issue there, it doesn't hurt us financially. And on the capital side, as William explained, we've got projects that are already on the books, ready to go. The mid is a great example where the offsite water mains that we're requiring them to build, but we're funding, were already programmed for this coming year. So the timing was just perfect. And that's a perfect type of development for something like that. So it's not an issue for us where we've already got capital improvement money set aside for projects that are going to assist this development. They would have been done anyway, as was pointed out, but it just worked out perfectly with the timing on the mid that the offsite water main work was already in our capital program was well, going to be done by the city anyhow, but in this case, we'll have the developer build it for us, dedicate it back to us, and if they don't perform, then we pull the bonds. Now, on an annual basis, William, mm -hmm. we review this to see if that if those incentive rates are then good. So X project locks it in for three years, mm -hmm. right? So the next project comes along and we say the following year, hey, we can't offer that much of an incentive because of X, Y, and Z. So the next project that comes asking for an incentive, then we'll get whatever the new rate is right. based on what the city is available to do. So we're not, okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm good with that. Commissioner Robinson? I was good uh, with uh, staff meetings before the question, so I'm comfortable as well. Uh, but in terms of mixed use, uh, didn't we have a study on the excess of retail uh, space in Lake Worth a couple years ago. There's two different studies um, and the CRA and, and, and Jenna Lee was here if she wants to elaborate. We had a study that we do lack retail, commercial, and office opportunities for our residents. However, as the mayor eloquently put earlier tonight, um, our market demographics don't work overly in our favor to encourage certain types of development. On the opposite end, when we redid the comprehensive plan, there was an overly abundant amount of property zoned only for office, commercial, and retail at the expense of property zoned for residential. So we switched the differentials. And so in our mixed use areas, we're now advocating to try to have at least or as much as 75% on residential and then 25% commercial office and general retail because 25% residential will not support 75 percent commercial office and retail so we switched those and those are the two things we studied thank you sure vice mayor and and i just wanted to mention I, i'm totally confident in um staff and you know i've sat in on meetings with um both william staff and joan um where you know i totally understand where commissioner hardy's coming from but sitting in with them it, it's very it, it comes across very clear that we are looking for mixed use and when joan puts her rfps out you know we've had developers say i want to do this this and this and she said well you're more than welcome to put your thoughts and and apply but we're looking for mixed use we're looking for x y and z so i i think that you know um the developers that are moving forward are are taking into consideration like the mid that we are looking for and and it only works that that we need a little bit more retail we need a little bit more office space but like you heard the mid say earlier you know they want something that complements the people that are living there and studies say 10 minutes you want everything within 10 minutes walkable sustainable city and that's what we're trying to create you know 
that that's what I want to retire in. You know, I'm not going anywhere, and I want to, as I get older, I want to be able to walk, sustain, and everything that I need within 10 minutes of where I live. All right, Assistant City Manager, do we have any public comment cards on that? We do not, Madam Mayor. Seeing there are none, we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you very much. And one thing that um, staff is going to work with and collaborate with the CRA, we are going to nominate this program for an American Planning Association Award and try to go to some national recognition because I've been unable to find another city that has this comprehensive array of development incentives as Lake Worth has been able to offer. So we're very excited about um, explaining those and marketing those at our event on the 29th of November in Vision Lake Worth. You will each receive an invitation shortly, and that's where we're going to um, be demonstrating the ideas from both public and private and school um, college age kids of 10 sites downtown, roll out some of the new incentives under our comprehensive plan, as well as our economic development program. And also there'll be a presentation about the major thoroughfares from our consultant. So it will be a very exciting evening. It will kick off the weekend of focus. Great. Thank you. Thank you Great. very much. I also want to stay too, for the record, our electric utility director didn't respond on that last one, but you had a vote of confidence again and you want to just state for the record so we have that because i asked the question to both of you and only got an answer from one uh, yes at liberty uh, electric utility director uh, i do have a strong level of confidence in in that effort um what we did in the design of the, of the rates was to credit back if you will a small portion of our fixed costs that we would incur none of our variable costs would be credited back for example fuel costs for example we would not credit that back but it's a good way to incent projects it's actually quite common uh, to be done in utility service territories and other parts of the country. So it's a way to spur development. And the return on investment is, is significant. It's a nice investment. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, I just took a mayor's. Uh, there we go. I'm sorry. I can barely read here today. Um, okay, we're moving on to the Lake Worth Electric Utilities. So you've got front row and center. We're moving on to the consent agenda. So moved. Seconded. Moved by Vice Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Commissioner Hardy. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. City Attorney, do you have a report? No, Madam Mayor. City Manager. Madam Mayor, thank you. The uh, acting City Manager. <laughs> Juan Ruiz, um, for the record, Assistant City Manager. Uh, real quick on the first item, going over the draft agenda for the November 13th meeting. It's still in process, I mean, put together. It's really light. Um, but Brian Shields, our water utility director, will be providing you guys with a presentation at your request on the ECR. Um, so we're saving about a 20 minute time frame during presentations for him to give you a, a good thorough review on the ECR. Um, okay, excellent. And then we have item B, which is get an update from Commissioner Maxwell. If you recall, at the October 18th workshop, um, Michael, um, our city manager, brought forward a, a ballot issue conversation and basically asked, you know, we did kind of an unofficial straw poll on three or four different items. One was renaming the city to Lake Worth Beach. Um, one was the sale of city property. And third was the long-term lease um, that we're going to bring back information on the Steinhardt property. Um, the Lake Worth Beach uh, changed the name, but it was 3-1 on the straw, straw poll. But we did want to ask uh, Commissioner Maxwell um, your position on these different ballot items. Um, so we can go one by one or however you want to take this. Who voted against I, the name I didn't, change? Uh, I don't have someone who voted against the name yeah. Do you have a 4-0? I do All for right, the I'm, name change, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe yeah. so too. So okay, so I stand corrected. I okay. remember on the board in, in the office saying three one. So no, four zero on the name 4 change. Four zero on the name change. We're just waiting for Commissioner Maxwell. Okay. Well, on the name change, I could not more enthusiastically um, recommend that we go in that direction. As you may recall, it was several years ago that I suggested this for a variety of reasons. <coughs> I'm quite sure I, I can't be positive, and I apologize for not having been at this meeting. On the 18th, but I'm quite sure many of those um, reasons for the name change were, were brought up and discussed. Um, and the biggest one that, that, in my mind, the two biggest ones in my mind are really um, going forward. You know, we've done so many wonderful things here in the last several years for the city, and we're moving in a different direction. And uh, there's some legacy uh, reputation issues that we're trying to fight. Uh, to get away from and unfortunately we're, we're not able to do that sometimes because of other parts of the county that have a lake worth address and when they are 
you know, they, they fall into a situation where something has happened in those, those areas and they're not terribly positive, be it crime or something else, oftentimes those news accounts and whatever are associated to, to us here in the city of Lake Worth. And I think it's time that we shed, uh, you know, some of the, the things that have been going on in, in the western part of the county and, and, you know, basically force essentially the media to recognize uh, just exactly who they're reporting on when these things come up. The other thing too is, you know, it's really interesting when you look at a lot of the names in, here in, in Palm Beach County. Uh, for example, uh, Royal Palm Beach doesn't have a beach. However, I will have to give them credit for being proactive on the sea level rise issue uh, because maybe that will catch up with them one day. Uh, but Royal Palm Beach doesn't have a beach. You know, West Palm Beach really doesn't have a beach. You know, so um, we have a beach. And if there's one thing that folks that come to Florida are attracted to oftentimes is the word beach. So if you're visiting Palm Beach County or you're thinking about Palm Beach County and you're kind of looking through all the 39 municipalities and you don't know any different, we might just pass Lake Worth over because the word beach isn't affixed to our name. So I, I enthusiastically support um, a name change. And I know that some folks may be a little uncomfortable with that and I understand that a change is difficult, but um, I think it's time for us to turn a page in the history of our city and move forward and um, you know get up there with everybody else. So I, I, I yes, I support that. Thank you. One of the other two items. Um, the second one was the consideration for the sale of city-owned property. So there was two specific properties that that were discussed. One was 501 Lake Avenue, which is a current office for leisure services down off of Lake Avenue, and that was I think uh, four. Or is that three it one? Was three three to one. Three, yeah, three yeses in favor to add that to the ballot for consideration for sale. Cool. Who was the one on the 501 Lake Avenue? Commissioner um, Robinson. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I don't think there was any dissent on I, the sale of no. 501 Lake Avenue. I think there was some dissent on yeah, other the, properties. The other two Not, right. uh, um, you said the chamber building, which is the five, is that's the chamber building. The mayor said yes, vice mayor said yes. He was the one that brought it up. Amari said yes. Herman said not at this time. No, that's not how it went. Uh, that's not how it went. I was in favor of selling the the uh, or putting the. Um, okay, the, I'll go back and listen to the tape. But you had some do. concern about the um, property being by Bryant Park, and you said so. I would not be in favor of it at this time. I'm. Yeah, you better look at it. Madam See, Attorney, I don't think can so. we? It, it was an unofficial straw poll that was taken. Can we retake the straw poll? Absolutely. Okay. So, if <laughs> Commissioner Robinson wishes to change I'm or not, not change, okay. yeah, or okay. to just clarify, just to clarify, okay. we will clarify yeah. it now as yeah, a quorum okay. on 501. Yeah, let's okay. make sure we yeah. get Commissioner I will Robinson definitely on record get that. correctly. Absolutely. Definitely. I want it to be correct. Um, so, your yes. Yes. There you go. Uh, now we have to get spots. <clears throat> okay. So Commissioner, Maxwell. Commissioner Maxwell, um, the first item for consideration for the Silla City property is 501 Lake Avenue. First of all, I want to apologize for not being at the workshop, so I didn't get to hear all this. Uh, but it sounds to me like we've got two or three individual um, pieces of property that we're talking about yeah. putting on the ballot individually. Is that what I'm hearing? <clears throat> yes, sir. Three. Okay. And. Uh, Let's go one by quite the two. Well, I guess my question is, and, 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 and unfortunately I don't have the benefit because I wasn't at the meeting, is why are we putting these on individually and why we're we not putting them all together? Uh, that's a question that needs to be asked. And I believe I, I'll let the staff address that. Of why 501 is not being put together or lumped together with the 12 acre? With that, whatever we're attempting to consider to put on the ballot for set. Why is it not all put on together? You know, and one. I may interject, and I was on vacation too, so I missed the meeting. But the development potential and the types of things that could be incorporated, if the properties were sold, are not are sort of mutually exclusive, and they should be considered separately because what could be, what could happen, um, would be different based on which one is actually considered. And trying to incorporate all three or more properties in one ballot language would not make it very easy to expressly. Um, describe to the public 
what actually was going to be happening and what would happen with that property. So it's probably their best um, interest, if there is an interest to sell the properties, is have them each listed individually and give the specific reason and development potential or idea of what that property could be. So in other words, we're not going to follow the model of the state. <laughs> <laughs> By lumping 16 we have lake like putting 16 poison pills in, in, in we're going to do 16 amendment. separate poison pills because it's lake worth way i see okay all right so i'm good with i i think we probably could use I, i'd really like to have a better idea and again i wasn't here so i'm sure the conversation was what may have been brought up you know if we're going to consider um the vesting ourselves if you will potentially of this property what are we doing with the staff and, and the current use? Where, where are these folks going to go? And you know what's going to happen with that? That's probably the question I have. Do we have a plan? Yes. Uh, tentatively, our plan would be to move them to the facility at 17 M Street, if I'm not mistaken, that was just acquired um, last month um, as a temporary place for them to be housed. Temporary. Temporary. Well, I'm hoping that at some point we're going to have a conversation about a longer term yeah. solution to staff. And I, but for the record, I'm not talking about building a new city hall or anything like that. I just, you know, I'm just, we need to figure out what we're going to, where we can put everybody that's, that's centrally located and is beneficial in terms of efficiency and communication and interaction and interfacing and all those other multiple syllable words I can come up with tonight uh, to make the city, you know, work a little bit better. And uh, so, yes, I'll, I'll support that. Understood. Thank you, um, Commissioner Maxwell. Uh, the second piece of property that was discussed um, for you to take uh, consideration on voting on was a 36-acre 30, parcel, also known as the ball field on the north side of 22nd Avenue. <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, that was 0-4 against putting on the ballot for, for consideration. It. it According to Michael's notes, it said uh, the mayor said no, the vice mayor said yes, Amari said no, and Herman said no. Okay, so one, three. Okay, and again, I, I want to ask the same question. Why? Because I know there's another piece, another question you're going to ask me in three minutes. Why are we not putting all this together? Because to me, they're not mutually exclusive. They are very similar in terms of um, what we're looking for for the future. And the question is, why are they not being combined? I think it goes back to the exact same answer that he had, but I think what we came down to in our discussion was one was one was a piece of property that had some existing usage on it, and the other was a piece of property that has no usage on it Correct. whatsoever. Right? And, they're, and they're not contiguous. And they're not contiguous. And one is embedded in the neighborhood and one is on the outside. Yes. Correct. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, I, I, don't, I think those are weak arguments because, frankly, the, the ballpark, if you're talking about the ballpark and the shooting range. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, the 36 acres. Just the north, that's just those, north those side, are, to be clear. That's smack dab in the middle of two neighborhoods. Correct. Okay. Uh, my, 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 so it's in the center of two neighborhoods. So my, it, in fact, is it within a neighborhood? Well, my com comments had to do with the fact of if, when you have, specifically because some of that land is still being used to this day, by a lease to sports, to the high school or whatever, part of that field is still being used, Manzo Field, that I, I don't personally have a belief, it's my personal belief, I don't believe that you, we need a parks master plan to show what we're gonna do. You can't threaten to take somebody's park away unless you tell them what you're gonna do with it. And, you know, you know and, what, and, we, we had this conversation when the, the issue came before us initially and we, we had the conversation about you know, a pending sale or consideration of that sale would be d dependent on a, a parks master plan, that the proceeds from that would go to a parks master plan. Right. And somehow the rug got ripped out from underneath us. I think we had, I think we're all moving in that same direction. And all of a sudden, well, it just didn't work out that way. Well, no, I think the fact of the matter is, is that you're asking to put the cart before the horse on this one. People need to know what's possible and where that might not the money not just going to a parks master plan but the money going to the parks you know have the master plan ahead of time the city needs to know where it's going what it's doing to have that plan into place and then when the money from somebody buys the project we could say that money would go okay. specifically to park projects uh, very well, well I'm not gonna, that's I'm no not, that was i'm my not argument. advocating one way or the other i you just could, this whole thing started out just recall back in the day we were talking about both pieces of, of, of 
of, of land were on the table, and then some of us got squirreled up, for, you know, over our politics. And, and that's what my concern is that if it was good enough to have that conversation then to move us, advance the ball, it should be good enough now. And, and that's all I'm getting at. So I, I, will, I will support, I will go along to get along for now. I will support 12 acres, which, it, 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 you know, I, I just think it's an injustice the way the whole process went down, frankly, because staff had worked so hard to position us to have these conversations, to be, be able to bring it back to us, to have a conversation, and it got derailed. It was derailed. Well, it wasn't because, unanimous, so you vote whatever way you want to vote. All right. Well, I'm just saying, so I will go along with the 12 acres. Yes, we're on the 12. We were talking about 36. Yeah, we were talking well, about the 36. We're not talking about I'm just sorry, to, I beg your just pardon. to clear the That's record, yeah, let's, let's yeah, keep them you're, separated. You're, yeah, you're combining two issues here. That's why I'm trying to have so a So on the 36 issue, on the 36 acres, I will, you know, reluctantly at this point, only because of the way the situation was handled, not because I think we shouldn't do it, but because I think we never gave the public an opportunity to see what the city had prepared to present to them, and that you know that we basically got ahead of ourselves, yeah. and we and we you know caused maybe maybe undue alarm. I'm not saying that it wasn't warranted, but you know we got way ahead of ourselves. And if there's one thing that I really 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 I'm disappointed in this that the amount of time and effort that staff puts into things only to have it derailed because of irresponsible comments that are made okay out of context and out of place uh that i just i'm sorry i just have a problem with that so um i you know for one minute don't believe that that land up there could not be put to a better use than what the fallow condition that it essentially exists there now uh, as far as the ballpark is concerned, nobody nobody in this room is more of a baseball fan than I am. It would bring a tear to my glass eye to see a baseball field taken down. Okay, but the reality of it is it's not generating any income for us. Okay, and the reality of it is, um, and we're, we're probably going to touch on this a little bit later this week, but, you know, the school board, you know, they, they need to step up and start providing some of their own facilities. Okay. Uh, I would think if I had a three billion dollar budget, I could probably be more, more creative in how I, you know, put my facilities together and provide for the basic things that that students and children need in their world, and, and physical education being a big part of that. So to rely on the municipality, and I'm sure we're paying what we get a dollar a year, if anything, for that. To, if you talk about a nickel holding up a potential dime here, that's what we're really talking about here. So if that's a really weak ex excuse for not moving forward on that land. And when you talk about the shooting range component of it, are you kidding me? What's ever going to be done with that? Okay, so shooting ready, ready shooting range and and Manzo Field is 36 acres. That's right. 12 acres is the other project that is completely overgrown in weeds and what not be being utilized. Right. I understand okay. that. So just when you make so, your vote, just say 12 acres, so, 36 acres so we know so what you're what saying. Well, I was asked this is 36 acres, so I will at this time saying I'm not in favor of putting it on the ballot and I'm just disappointed that things worked out the way they did. I think the public should have had an opportunity to see a much bigger vision and it, it was and I think they were cheated in that respect. That's not to say they wouldn't have liked the vision once they were given the opportunity to see it, but I just think they were cheated for never having been have given the opportunity to see it in the first place. And I would encourage them that as you to come back, should you come up with a master plan that shows that it's something that could be utilized in their facility to have that would be useful to them. Again, I'm just not in favor of threatening to take something away before you even show okay. what doing that is. That's why I said that. But okay, so then you've got the 36 acres. You said your comment. Now, what okay. about the 12 acres? Just uh, what we have. Because this I, is his idea. We again, have a whole half hour to spend. No, 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 on him. no, 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 please. No, no, we're, we don't have to fritter our way half an hour. We can be efficient. There, plenty of work. Okay, so again, for the record, as we all know, one of the beautiful things about our our, our charter is that we put these things to the vote of the people. Correct. And, and so I'm comfortable no matter which way I go with this because at the end of the day, it will be responsibility and the obligation of the people to decide what they want to do. So I'm very comfortable with my decision. I'm disappointed, like I said, that they were cheated out of at least looking at potential on that. So the 36 acres, I'm good with. We're, I don't, I'm not going to... You're good uh, with it? Or I'm, you... No, I'm good with not putting it on the ballot. Okay, that's not okay. Good. And what was the vote on the 12? That you want me to say what the the vote yeah, so last be a one? Part of the, conversation the mayor said that. no, vice mayor said yes, Omari said no, and Herman said yes. No, Herman <laughs> didn't say no. I didn't no, say Herman no. Said yes. Yes. She, and, I'm confused uh, now. 
Yeah, I'm serious? saying no to putting the 36 acres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and she said, now we're talking about, now we're talking about the 12, 12 acres. acres. 36 okay. acres. All right, everyone, point of order, please. Yeah. This is how it gets nuts here, right? This whole issue is for Commissioner Vice Maxwell. Mayor Pro Tem to answer the questions, not for us. They can know our vote and let him give his answers, right. and then we can move on, okay? Right. This is not, and when I said half hour, well, it's going to take a total of the, half hour to get. But, no, when recorded correcting wrong. when and it's recorded wrong, yes, but it wasn't the 36 acres, it was the 12 acres. Okay. Thank you. If you could be succinct, that would be great. Two to two. Two to two. So, so I get to be a tiebreaker? You get to be a Correct. tiebreaker, and that's okay with us. Do you need to change your vote? I'm sorry, Commissioner Robinson. If if I if we've recorded it wrong, I, I don't... want the 12 acres on the This back. is the yeah. 12 acres. Yes. Okay. Okay. You want that on the ballot. Yes. yes, that's right. And for the record, do we have anybody sniffing around up there that's got a plan that's been presented to the city? Yes. What, can we please, one at a time, he asked a question, let him answer, and then I'll come to you, and I'll come to you, and everyone with the light on to say something. Can you repeat that question? The question is, do we have anybody that's approached the city on that land, and do they have a plan? Because I have not spoken to anybody about that. If there is a plan out there, somebody's looking. I need to know. I don't have the knowledge to answer that one way or another on the 12th. Uh, I stand corrected. There has been one proposal submitted yeah. to the city That's a while the back. Unsolicited, right. unsolicited bid from Merritt Todge um, that was submitted months ago on the 12 acre parcel. One at a time. When I call you, I run, that's how the meeting goes, okay? I call your name and you answer. Please, guys, it gets so confusing when you start talking over one another, really. Commissioner Robinson, you had your, your light on. Did yes. Something else well, want? I wanted to to make sure that the, the are we going to look at the ballot language uh, now or later? Or I want to specify uh, what is going, what we're offering on the 12 acres. Uh, I want to uh, uh, make a uh, <clears throat> understand what the public. Uh, can get up there and not what the zoning allows uh, i want to put uh, criteria uh, restrictions on 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 the uh, offer i mean we're just offering it to the public uh, uh, and we don't know we don't have to sell it if we don't like the offers uh, but i want to i want to put uh, an understanding of what uh, we're going to allow to be put there and that's that's going to be another conversation or you want yes. to have it now or later or what? that's the ballot language right. conversation that will happen after you decide whether you want to put it on the ballot for example say if you said okay i i want I, i'm for this as long as we state that the, the desire of the commission is to have this as single family residential property only or <coughs> as whatever whatever way it's going to be worded in the ballot That'll come before this commission, yes. okay. and that will first before it even goes to that next to the next step, okay. and we would get a chance to talk about that and debate <coughs> that and figure that out too. This is just whether or not you'd be you'd be you'd want to put it on the ballot as a ballot item issue. Yes, with with, with uh, criteria. With yes. criteria, but right yes. now, right now you're yes. yeah you're not developing the criteria. Now you're just saying whether you want to go to the ballot. With, and with and Madam Mayor, if I may, we, we've engaged a consultant to start working on, you know, who will be working with us with the ballot language. And that's going to come back at the December 4th meeting um, for, for your approval before it goes any further. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor for Temporary Maxwell asked a question and there was more of an answer than what was provided. Um, and I, I feel compelled to, to uh, provide more of what was not provided okay there is a developer okay who wanted to put an offer in on the property using our process for receiving and considering unsolicited bids one of the first things we did actually it was the, it was the very first meeting in march of 2017 we approved a process for the city to consider unsolicited bids okay and the developer asked about this process and was basically told yes the process could be used and the developer wanted to submit an offer to the city before the land use was potentially put in place. This is when we were considering the comprehensive plan in the flu. Okay, so our staff 
our city manager told the developer, wait until the um, future land use is approved before you submit. And after that, we will be happy to receive anything that you might give us. And the developer said, okay. And the developer came in and submitted an offer precisely when he was told that an offer could be made. Okay. Under the idea that he could use the unsolicited bid process and that it would actually be used. Since then, since that offer has come in and it, every single person up here has received physically the offer, or at least it was put in our mailbox. Um, my understanding is, is that the developer made five copies available for members of the commission. I, don't, I never received that's so that's very interesting what I do know is that the developer made five copies available through city staff when the offer was made so that's 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 um, uh, something that I think should have been disclosed which was not when you asked the question does someone have a plan for this has someone been sniffing around that wasn't disclosed okay since then we have apparently staff has changed their mind on whether or not the unsolicited bid process could be used for land that is deemed public, right? So after, and this is this is kind of similar to what we went through with the future land use, right? Remember, we had the future land use for the ball fields and that 12 acre parcel on the table because the idea was, okay, if you change the future land use, you can then change the zoning from P to something else. And that would not necessarily require a, a, um, a, a, a ballot initiative. Well, after that process was begun, more thorough analysis was conducted. And we basically said, well, if we want to avoid a lawsuit, and if you don't want to tie up someone potentially, then you have to put it on the ballot because someone could say, well, that's not good enough. Simply changing the land use and then changing the zoning isn't good enough. A similar thing happened here. We and city staff said that we have this unsolicited bid process we could use this, this property would be eligible for that. And then someone used the information that was basically represented to them. And then after the fact, the idea was changed. Well, oh, well, regardless of the unsolicited bid process, we would have to put this up for a ballot. And then the idea is, well, you have to potentially put it out there for a bid. Now that should have been disclosed. And here's the thing. Any bids, and I, I'm on the record as being against putting the 12 acres up for sale as, as you are, Madam Mayor. Any bid that comes in, any bidder that comes in, can use the offer as research that was made on this property in creating their bid. All of that, in my opinion, should be disclosed. I, 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 and, and I don't, I have to say, I do not like the way that this process has rolled out in both occasions. I agree with Commissioner Maxwell. I think there should have been more information up front. Okay. And 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 yeah, um, the other thing is we haven't budgeted for a Parks and Recs master plan. It's actually not on our budget. So I think if we're both concerned about that, I think we should potentially move to amend that budget in future meetings, just FYI. But I think all of that information is important because it's information that is relevant to your decision and was not shared. My... Uh, for the record, unless I don't know when it was or whatever, I never received any notification from them on it. I would tell you honestly that I am, we're talking, for me, the difference is parkland, utilized parkland mm -hmm. and public land are mm -hmm. two different things in my mindset, mm -hmm. okay? I know it's P for both public and parks, right? Is that correct or no? We no. Have, we have P for public and we have P-R-O-S for um, public recreation open space. Well, see, I, I was under the impression initially, and this is, that, that it was not just public space, but parks space had to go before. Parks do. Okay. So that's, hence my feeling on the, on the 36 acres. My feelings are different on the boat, to, on the, on the 12 acre property in regards to that. I voted for it because again, we're, we're going through a community that's, we're looking for, you know, all, all this, your district that's been inundated again, some, some streetwise master plans need to happen and whatever, if you're talking about an increase in traffic, I am in support of a, you know, a similar type of single family community through that area with the approval. But again, asking for some of these issues before you've even gone into the community to have the conversations with it. And I have not been able to have conversations 
as of yet in there in reference to I, I tend to my opinion tends to lie differently on the 12 acres than it does on the 36 acres in regards to active space ball field space or whatever and you know what we need a parks master plan because between the parks that just show up and the parks that don't exist and who we're taking care of and where we're maintaining and not maintaining and what we're doing i mean just like we did with a master plan there was no such thing as a master plan for roadways you know if we're going to keep talking about parks ad nauseum in this city and how much more when we can't even maintain the ones that we have let's figure out what we're going to do with it and put make sure that there's a park within walking distance to every kid in this community and let's make sure that the money from this park land that's been used as a field goes to create better parks for our families and kids that's all I was saying. Commissioner Robinson? Uh, I was privy to the unsolicited bid and- no. I was not. Well, I will- We I'm all just, got it the same I'm day, just, but. What, when was it? <clears throat> when was it? I can't, I can't June, recall. Whatever. Uh, I'm, I just want to say that I was privy to it and that's not at all what I would like to see on the 12 acres. So uh, I congratulate staff for taking us in, in terms of a city to have developers come and, and want to uh, develop in the city, you, you did your job and uh, it was up to the developer to uh, do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, I, I uh, am interested in selling this 12 acres. I, I, I don't know when we're gonna have the conversation, but uh, the ballot question needs needs to be clear that we already uh, specified that and you voted yes for the 12 no for the 36. i'm yes trying to find 12. out when we're going to talk about what we're going to be offering the next time it comes before us december, december, 4th. december 4th december 4th, yeah. 4th we're going then we need to be prepared for uh, a discussion of, of what is Correct. the expectation okay good Correct. Let's, now let's get down to the item half an hour 35 as i said it was going to be half hour half hour later as to what Vice Mayor Pro Tem Maxwell would like to answer so we can move on from this, please, because we've already had two hours of conversation about this the last time. 12 acres. 12 acres. I got that. <laughs> I'm a little bit concerned here because, you know, and I thank you, Commissioner Omari, for, you know, giving you, give us your, this, your interpretation, your Rec uh, recollection of how things transpired. Um, I think, you know, what, what would it, how much of a problem would it be for me to get with legal over this and come back to the next meeting? Can you just, now that we know your opinions, can we let staff discuss it with him and not have to publicly vet it like this no so i'm not asking on? i'm not asking for a public no that, discussion that was, legally. What was requested by the commission that's why we're doing this with you right now because they didn't want you to have a discussion with staff alone they wanted you to publicly vet this information yes that was what that's what? Yes. yes why would i not have a conversation with the legal team no they wanted they wanted you to discuss your feelings in front of the public the, public. the way we did it the last meeting because you weren't here. Staff asked if because you weren't here, they could just discuss this with you and see and add you okay. to the straw poll. But they had to do it this way. So, so I guess, Christy, could you affirm, is there anything that Commissioner Omari has said here this evening that is materially inaccurate? The, the way the issue was brought up to legal was, could the city change the zoning and that would take it out of the charter provision that requires you to go to a referendum. Technically, the answer is yes, you could do that because that's within your power within the comp plan to do that. However, the intent we believe of that charter provision is if it's parkland, you will go out to a referendum before you consider selling it. So based on our belief of what the intent was, and knowing that there could be a potential lawsuit that would hold up any kind of development, we recommended you should take this to a referendum before you consider doing this. So that is um, when we took a closer look at the issue. Well, in my mind's eye, it doesn't matter what we, unless I've missed something in all this time that I've been sitting up here. And I hate to say that because somebody said, yeah, you sure did. Uh, but in my mind's eye, if we owned the property to begin with, 
It doesn't matter what the zoning is. We still have to take it to referendum in order to uh, for us to, to relinquish it to, to a, a different owner other than ourselves. There was a, there was a, let's just say a sticky wicket. The charter right. actually stipulates right. that property that is zoned public or as parks has to go out for referenda to be sold. My right. understanding is that anything that we own, any property with the exception of like code related, uh, what do you call it, foreclosures, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. we, we I have think, uh, Commissioner Downtown Maxwell, parks. what Commissioner Hardy was mentioning was that we have a process where city owned lots that aren't identified in the charter, specifically ones that aren't park, specifically ones that aren't P, specifically ones in the downtown area, we have the ability to sell <coughs> those based on unsolicited proposal. And that's what we often do with those smaller lots we gain through different means. Okay. The charter provisions are very specific in terms of property downtown, mm -hmm. property that's identified as park and, and parking lots. And parking lots downtown and public that by the charter provisions we have to go out for referendum. May I add to what you just said I said? The the all yes, that is that is correct, right? And the only other thing is that in discussing these matters with other people, and I was present at one meeting with city staff and a developer, the city's position as I understood it, and also as the developer understood it, was that the unsolicited bid process could be used for a property like what we have up at the 12 acres, provided that land use and zoning changed. So the developer, would not have put forward a an offer that was contingent on a, a ballot thing. So I just wanted to clarify that, that which is a process that. issue that, that, is that totally we process. have well, to. There was a subsequent meeting where it was the city manager's office to determine we could take unsolicited bids for these types of properties, but the unsolicited bid would have to go to referenda in order to be approved. Was the developer present at this subsequent? As meeting? I recall, I believe he was. That is, well, put it this way. I was present at the first meeting. I was not present at the second meeting. I can't talk about what was there, but the developer obviously submitted something that he felt we had the authority to do things that it later turned out we don't have the authority to do. And so even if there was a subsequent meeting, the fact that we told someone at a first meeting that we could do something we couldn't do. I agree. And I the understand. person, we represented that to that person, the person acted on that. So I, that, right. again, that's a process issue. And if their, if their presentation could be protected, I don't know, by some of the same economic development rights, could we? Could we it's already public. It's already yeah. public? Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, just to explain the process, what would happen is we have to prepare an ordinance for each of these referendum items. So we would come back on December 4th, I think with some proposed language mm -hmm. that then would have to come before the commission for approval. So if there was going to be some requirements put on what could happen say with the 12 acres, that would be in that ballot language that would be discussed in okay, December. We've, we've already said that and we've done it and we still haven't heard an answer. So if we could end this. Well, now, uh, I I, Madam Mayor, I appreciate your eagerness to, to wrap this up. I, you know, again, I still, I'm still slightly confused and I'm trying to understand the implications of putting this on the ballot. So let me just ask another couple of questions and maybe we can wrap this up. So if, if we decide to go with ballot language, all we are doing at that point is uh, permitting staff to bring us language that we may tweak, okay, that specifies the conditions under which the land can be sold. Yes, sir. Then my next question is, do we have to come back and ask the voters again to actually sell the land? Or does it become a political decision that open subject to interpretation of the ballot language and somebody comes along with a proposal? That's my question. Does that make sense? I, I think what you're saying is if we draft by example, a ballot language that says, can the city sell the 12 acres that are currently designated as, I guess it's park. Well, the 12 acres now have a future land use of single family residential and underlying zone and have a uh, P or PROS, I can't remember which. Okay, so if we drafted proposed language that said, can the city sell off this land 
to be used consistent with the uh, future land use, future land use map um, designation, that language would be the language that would then go on the ballot. And if the voter said yes to that, then we could sell it with that designation. So whoever came in to develop it would have to abide by that designation. Oh, man. But then again, you wouldn't have to put anything into the proposed language regarding that. You could just simply ask, can we sell this property? And if the answer to that is yes, then it would be left up to your typical zoning, your comp plan to determine what would be the, you know, the best use for that property. I think what I'm, I think what I'm hearing you say, and I think what I'm trying to get at here is, is really, really, really very simple. Unlike the, the building downtown, that's, that's a straight up deal. You got a, you got a block or whatever it is, or we've got a building on it. We want to sell it and divest ourselves. We know what we got. We know what we're selling. Okay. We don't know what the potential necessarily is for the 12 acres because they're just a, a myriad of different ideas that could come into play. And with those different ideas creates potential conflict for the neighborhood. Okay. So I think it is simpler as a matter of process to say, uh, I guess I'm hoping following along here to say, you know, with your additional approval down the road, can we consider this property? How do I say this? We would make it available for sale if the right deal comes along and then the voters have to vote on whether or not the deal is right. Does that make sense? So like a second referendum? Well, that's, yeah, I hate to say it that way, but that's kind of what I'm thinking of. I, I, what I'm getting at is I, I'm not comfortable right now. Then vote no. Well. If you're comfortable, vote yes. It, I think that's vote, no. where Madam Mayor. Choice. It's kind of an open-ended, I'd rather, I'd rather if they want, if the, if the public is willing to consider the, the sale of it, if the right deal comes along, then the public should say, okay, we believe this is the right deal and, and vote on it the second time, rather than a situation where, you know, staff says, yeah, it fits the, the zoning or it becomes a, something up here between the five of us or the future five of us that may not be consistent or necessarily, you know, embraced by the immediate neighborhood. Who's going to invest in a community if they don't know what they can do to do it? it it's, you know, I mean, it, you, I, again, we, we always, I always feel so conflicted when it comes to, you know, we're talking about telling a private entity, once you change a law, or you do something on it, that entity has the right to do whatever it is within the confines of our laws to do what they want to do in there, so to, to, to create parameters. If you're going to say, is it available for sale? Number one, say, what was the land doing before? No. Well, let's see. It's been infested with rodents and rats and things of that nature. And there's nothing on it. And there's nothing built there. And there's no traffic. I mean, it's an empty piece of land, basically, that's been not utilized. Okay, so now we know what it did in the past. In the future, what do you want? What do you want the future? What do you want the future to be? Do you want it to be mixed use, MF this? Single family that, whatever. And that's December 12th. And that's decided on the ballot to, to right. say. So at least it gives, if you agree, if people vote for it, then they know. And anybody who makes a, a, a bid on it would know that they could do this or not do this. If you say no and don't put it on the ballot, then well, why don't then make we'll it a little further simpler. discussions. Um, just ask your consensus, Mr. Maxwell, that staff and the, with the help from the attorney's office put together some sample language for the 12 acres for you to discuss on December 12th, because you're still going to have to vote and approve to put it on the ballot, even if you can a, a nod and say, well, I'm open to it being sold tonight. We still have two more steps to go through. Well, you know, I just want to make sure. I just don't, I think we all voted and took a stand on it that we, to have him say, well, I'm not going to vote on it until the next time around is unfair because we had to take, well, the, we had to make a vote on it. So. I need to have all That's the facts, unfortunately, place. because I wasn't here. I didn't have the benefit of all the conversation that took place. Okay. All right. You know what? I'm sorry. You know, Hardy? sometimes, is this my time to speak or not? I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Well, my lips were still moving. I was making sounds. So I, I'm thinking that maybe I was still talking. No, I'm sorry. We created a whole special agenda item just well, for you. And so I appreciate gonna... that. But you know what? I want to I want to do the right thing here. Okay. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm the split. I'm, I'm the swing vote here. Did you watch the commission meeting that we all? No, I'm afraid I didn't. Oh, okay. Okay. 
I mean, I don't want to stop. I don't want to let you speak because he'll say he's still talking. Well, so please. You know what? We're getting catty up here. That's not necessary. Could, Hold quiet in the chambers, please. Could I? Hold on a second. I'm just waiting to see if he's finished. Trying. Uh, on the 12 acres, the mayor voted no. The vice mayor voted yes. Amari voted no, and Herman voted yes. While you think about it, can I go to Commissioner Hardy? Sure. Um, what we're trying to figure out is whether or not we will discuss on an actual agenda any potential ballot language about this 12 acre parcel. And so I am for the record against selling the 12 acre parcel. But if Commissioner Maxwell, you have you want to put some specific things in the ballot language that will put parameters around what and so do I. What it what it what could be done, well, that can be discussed both between you and staff between now and December 4th, and it can be discussed on December 4th. Okay. So that so that we're all clear about that. Okay. In my recollection, I don't think we've had, in, since this charter provision was implemented back in, I think, 2002, I don't believe we've had a situation where we've actually had to put this into play so much. Okay, so this is kind of our first crack at this. Okay, so we we don't have the benefit of history of the process, how it would unfold, other than what it would theoretically look like on paper. The, the challenge that I have is that because of, like I said, the, the earlier thing with the whole not letting staff do their thing and, and show something, you know, there were a lot of unanswered questions by a lot of unanswered questions by a lot of people out there. But more importantly, geographically speaking, we were talking about a piece of property that's in the northwest corner of our city. And because we've not done this before, we're asking the entire, which is how the process was, I guess, set up because of the charter, we're asking the entire city to vote on it. As it should be. Well, if I lived in the northwest west quadrant of the city, Bingo. okay. It's not like it's a centrally located piece of property here. Yes. And these are some of the unintended consequences that were not considered in the haste that was taken back in 2000. And I won't call it the haste. I think it was well-intentioned. But the, the whole purpose of that, that charter provision back in the day is because, as we still do to this day in 2018, we still have people that believe that we can sell the dog on beach. And that is what precipitated this charter provision in the first place. It was bad information, it was misinformation, it was disinformation, and it was politics at its height that put this in a situation on the ballot, or on, in our charter. And here we are 16 years later, having to face the reality of actually implementing this provision, and there are more unanswered questions about how does this impact the quality of life of the people that are gonna be directly infected. And then you take on top of that the fact we kind of boogered it up because we never allowed city staff to bring forth something that we could talk about openly before the cat was let out of the back and people were misinformed once again. So we've created this mess. We've created this mess. And I don't know that it's a simple question of coming together on the 4th with some proposed ballot language that's going to clean all this up. We're still faced with what's going to end up there these people are going to be directly impacted and the rest of us, what do I care? I mean, theoretically, I don't mean this, in a, in a, but I mean, in theory, why should I care in the southwest quadrant of the city? It doesn't directly impact me. Really? That's the downfall. That's the unintended consequence of this charter provision. Okay. So that's where I'm at. Uh, you know, my, my job is to look out for what's in the best interest of the entire city. Okay. And to think that somebody might get injured in the process of, of something like this, it doesn't settle very well with me, and I'd like to have a little more information. But if you all think that, that somehow we can cobble together some ballot language that's going to satisfy my curiosity and my, my concerns, then I say we move forward. But what I don't want, hold on, what I don't want is a political hot potato. I don't want this to start a war, a conversation of people warring against each other because of, of I just think this is what we were trying to avoid in the first place. That what the charter amendment was intended to do was to avoid that. 
So that's kind of where I'm at. So if it sounds like I'm not giving you an answer, I'm saying let's go ahead and bring the, la the, the, the language forward. We don't have to adopt it and we don't have to move forward. But I just want for the record everybody to understand that, you know, that these unintended consequences are now coming rearing their head 16 years after the fact. Oh, and we're stuck with, you know, we're kind of like the guinea pig, the first ones that have to test us how this provision works in our charter. Hence and what is that going to do to us in terms of um, our relationship with the community and how they feel about, you know, government, trust in government, the whole nine yards? Well, it comes before, and, and hence my frustration, please, my fellow commissioners. My frustration comes simply from the fact that we're, like I said, we, we voted the way that we did only because I still have more questions. I still want to talk to the neighborhood. I still want to exactly. see something on paper. Mm -hmm. So I voted no, not because I don't think that that couldn't possibly be a potential for something, but it has to be the potential for the right something. And and the one thing I am consistent on is always speaking and, and getting a feel for what's going to happen before you throw something in somebody's face and threaten to take something away or or give something or before people even have a chance to understand it. Mm -hmm. I understand, I'm not trying to legislate every item and whatever, but this is a big project. And again, we are testing something out for the first time, you know, this charter thing that was created. And I'd wanna have more conversations about it, you know, and, and I believe that, well, I've said it before. I don't need to repeat myself. We have said it before, so I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you go from a straw poll. Sorry, my Roberts rules doesn't doesn't do straw polls that often. But so I don't know if you need if you can need to have an answer to the fifth member since we all said yay or nay, or if you don't have to have an answer, I don't know. What you, I'm asking the attorney. Well, I, I interpreted his response as bring the language forward on December fourth, and then we'll hash it out and that will still be the commission's opportunity to vote it up or down. It will come in an ordinance format. There will be two two further meetings on it. So he doesn't have to. Well, also, Christy, I think what we should also put together for you is what we anticipate the schedule being, as Mr. Maxwell mentioned, is uncharted territory. Just because you put it the ballot out there and the citizenry votes, yes, we're open to it being sold. That's not a fait accompli. There's a whole other series of steps before anything would happen there. So for you to have a complete picture of what would be required to have even a house built on that property, I think Christy and I can work together to give you a sort of a schedule. These are the things that would have to happen even if the ballot language were approved and have that for you on the fourth as well. Let's see where my problem lies, William, and I don't mean to be negative. Those conversations should have happened before this. We're constantly putting the cart before the horse, and that's where we end up getting kicked by the donkey or the horse we all the time. Revise. And we have to keep going. I mean, yeah. you know, give the information first. Let everybody hear and know, and then talk about it, and then decide, and whatever. We keep trying to legislate something before we even have the information, and then we wonder why everyone's hands are thrown up in the air. Final comment. Can I, Can I speak, please? Uh, you know, we've Commissioner Maxwell has decided to. Well, excuse me, Mr. Robinson. Commissioner Robinson, go ahead, please speak. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, uh, I've listened a lot to a lot of conversation tonight, and Commissioner Maxwell has decided to move it forward uh, so that we can talk about the language that's going to be on the ballot and what we would like to see on the twelve acres. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, it's important to me to get the best possible uh, product up there for the entire city. Uh, I know that when it's in your backyard, it's important, but when it benefits the entire city, uh, it's even more important. Um, so I would be glad to vote no if, it, if I feel that it isn't uh, in the best interest of the entire city. Uh, we're not but at least anymore. we're moving forward. So I don't know why we're having uh, continuing to have the conversation. He apparently wants to move it to the next step. Gotcha. Vice can, Mayor? Can we do that? We did. Vice Mayor? No, um, Your light's on. I know. Your light's on. <laughs> My light's off. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Vice Mayor Pro Tem? Just want, again, Madam Mayor, I hope that I'm speaking about the same thing when you talked about the cart before the horse. You know, this whole thing, this whole debacle, in my mind, this whole debacle about that land up in that part of the city came about because people were out there and started telling people we were going to sell the land without the benefit of the staff who were very close to having something to present. And they started a fire. 
and then they threw gasoline on the fire. And then they kept throwing more stuff on the fire. So, and so now we, you know, instead of what could have been a really wonderful thing where we could have had, uh, you know, maybe some tax base, additional tax base and some funding for parks and all those things we've talked about here. Now that's all disjointed and we got to figure out how to fall back and put it all back together again. So uh, like I said, as, as far as the process is concerned, let's bring the ballot language forward. I, I've already asked uh, to meet with the folks in Vernon Heights because I need to know what they want, uh, to, <coughs> what they have to say about all this. Um, again, it's the, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Anything that goes there, the people that would live there, which is essentially what we're talking about, we're not talking about a mall back there or commercial, they're going to have to drive through their neighborhood. They don't. Okay. Okay. So it, 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 it bears more conversation. And, and I'm sorry that it took so long for me to, to, to give you my answer, but I'm all about process. I like process as much as the next. But let this, let this be a lesson to us on two fronts. Number one, the hastiness to which that charitable language was put in to begin with. Again, misinformation and all that put us in this place. And number two, you know, uh, going out there and starting fires in the community when staff has worked so hard, to, to, which is what we paid them for. We, we paid them and employed them for their expertise to identify opportunities and bring them forth to us and to have the legs kicked out from underneath them before they even got a chance to bring it forward on an equal basis where everybody had an equal opportunity to take a look at it. And, and we end up having these conversations and, and you know the anxiety level for all of us goes up. So I'm, I'm done. I'll look forward to the ballot language. Vice Mayor, did you have something more on this issue? Because we still haven't talked and gotten his ideas on the Steinhardt property yet. Yes, oh, my geez. ask would be just like <laughs> Commissioner Maxwell it's had said. It's one that we reach out to the neighborhood and that we meet with staff before the fourth so staff has our thoughts on what we'd like to see in it so the meeting does not become a three-hour meeting however i do let staff with, with two December, items on the agenda okay but this december 4th please leave enough time to have a lengthy conversation in case that does not happen but you know could we please get with staff and talk to staff about what your thoughts are um that you'd like to see in the language. Okay, and Steinhardt property. What's the what's deal on my favorite piece of property on the west side of the <laughs> inter intercoastal, or the east side, um, or whatever that is? That they, is, <laughs> I hate to use the term house cleaning item, but it's related back to the county. And what what's the word? I don't want to say property switch, or, um, but we need to put, we need to put the property on the ballot for consideration for a 99 year lease with them and then staff's working on putting together a presentation with more details as requested at, at the 18th workshop to get in into the details of exactly um what the agreement will, will look like on that 99 year lease but, but if you call this we're, we're talking about the 99, 99 year lease to the county to correct the county. and and it's you know in the property you know the, the improvements have already taken place there so it's right, so i hate house to use the word house cleaning let's item it. let's do it all right, that'll wrap it up. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Good night, everybody. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Yes. Rest up, please.